This is an Audio Holdings production. Donnie Brasco, My Undercover Life in the Mafia, written by Joseph D. Pistone and Richard Woodley, read by Joseph D. Pistone. October 21st, 1980, at approximately 12.20 in the afternoon, a call was made by S.A. Joseph D. Pistone, utilizing the name Donnie Brasco from telephone number 813-938 to telephone number 212-383-9. Individuals S.A. Pistone talked to were John Sarasano, a.k.a. Booby, and Dominic Napolitano, a.k.a. Sonny Black. What's going on? How are you, pal? All right, how are you? Out in Florida. <laughs> come down and visit. You must be used to it by now. Yeah, well, I'm waiting for you to come back. Well, you see, I, now I'm about ready to come back. You well, know what you mean? Because these uh, visits once in a great while, <laughs> I, I can accept, you know, and enjoy. But the goal... Well, listen, ah. now you come to dog tracks open. I mean, there's something to do at night. Uh-huh. We can go to dog races. I like... Yeah. You know, uh-huh. we don't have to sit around and be dead at night. Yeah, that sounds good. I'm taking a beating at the dogs, though. But you're lucky, so maybe uh, <laughs> when you come, maybe my luck will change. I told Tony to tell Sue to send him my sympathy about a Yeah, dad died, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. Late, you know? Is, uh, <clears throat> is the, uh... Up on the roof, you want him to call you? Hang yeah. on a minute, Tony. Okay. Hello. How are you, pal? What's up with the pigeons? No, but did you go out there? Huh? Yeah. Uh huh. All right. Yeah. Where are you now? Home? Yeah. Is Lefty there? I'll call you right back because I got a Florida call here. Oh, I think he's talking to me. Hello. Yeah. Is Lefty there? He's across the street, Lefty. Putting the uh. lion in the truck. He, he got the lion in the truck. Yeah, they got to get rid of the lion. I know. Who's he gonna give it to? He wanted, you know what he wanted to do? He's crazy. What? He said, I, he said, I'll ship it down there and you can chain it in back of the club. Yeah. He's screwy. Yeah, he's nuts. <laughs> a lion, a chain, imagine that? He's nuts, there's no question about it. If he gets somebody to give it to? Huh? He gets somebody to give it to? Yeah, well, they're going to reach out, but in the meantime, this guy's got to get him out from underneath the bar there. <laughs> First of all, somebody ratted him out. Oh. Was there last night. Oh, is that right? Yeah, and they said, uh, you got a lion here? And he, you know, Charlie said, no, we ain't got no lion here. Mm, I don't. You know? <laughs> like a $10,000 fine, I understand. Yeah, well, that's what left you. I was talking to Lefty about one this morning. He was telling me. Yeah. He said $10,000 fine. It was probably somebody's, uh, you know, uh, mother or something worried about her kids. Yeah, and, sure. Uh, that knows it, yeah. what happened. Yeah, all right. Well, listen, if uh, if Lefty comes in, uh, walks over, tell him to give me a call. Right, listen, his son, he just walked in the door. All right, right let me, yeah, yeah. Son, Donnie, Florida. Huh? Yeah, man. Yeah, son. What? Listen, I just want to tell you, you know, uh, the the uh, the lady we called down in Miami? Yeah? Yeah, uh, <clears throat> she wants uh, 200, you know, for the service. So, uh, for, for what, weekly? No, no, from from when we started to up to now. All right, so give it to them. All right, I just wanted to, I just wanted to clear it with you. All right. All right, pal? Listen. What about you? Supposed to let me know something on that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Did we t- uh, you gotta see that guy when this afternoon. Yeah. Yeah. We t- he was in last night and uh, he's gonna let us know something this afternoon. All right. All right, bro. Yeah. All right. Bye-bye. All right. The next voice you hear was recorded by an FBI wiretap. It is my voice. The guy I'm talking to is Benjamin Lefty Guns Ruggiero. A wise guy, a mafia hitman. Hey, Lef, I checked. I I go over the money every every, every night. What starts and what. You Donnie, know. I'm not questioning you. I'm not questioning anything. You know, let me tell you something, Donnie. Well, you have no idea what we went through. Right, you right. don't know. This went on for fucking eight days. With you guys. I mean, heavyweights had to sit down. I know. No, you don't. Well, know. you told I wish me. You did know. I mean, well, how come you never tell me? 
Uh, can I tell you anything on the phone? You, you know, we're not playing games. I know. You know, Sadie was a meeting uh, in New York. Well, you didn't know. to call me up and tell me. You didn't know it. I was connected to Lefty Ruggiero. I worked for him. The bosses of New York's Bonanno Mafia family had just attended a sit-down to pass judgment on a serious complaint about me, about my behavior as a criminal associate of the mob. I had been accused of skimming drug profits. Lefty had protected me, stood up for me. In a way, Lefty was my friend. Well, I mean, as it comes down, we, we won the decision. The whole thing. Oh, all right. You have no body to... Listen. What? I'm going to tell you now, pal. You belong to me and me alone. Right? Any responsibility, I die with you. I know that. Uh, no, 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 that's the truth. Uh, I'm sending my son out next week. Lefty Ruggiero's message to me that day in 1982 was that, thanks to his intervention, the bosses had decided I would not be whacked, rubbed out, killed. As he reassured me, Lefty had no way of knowing that I, Donnie Brasco, was neither a faithful mafia associate nor his junior partner in crime. My real name is Joseph D. Pistone, and I was the first FBI agent to ever successfully infiltrate deep into the mafia. The evidence I gathered would make headlines. My testimony in court would take several years to complete. Thanks to me, Lefty would go to prison for many years, and so would other important mafia crime bosses. And my reward? Congratulations. Grateful handshakes from important justice and FBI officials. A sense of pride in what I accomplished as an FBI agent. But the price was high. When I began my assignment, I was married with three young daughters. I abandoned my family almost completely for five years in order to live as a criminal. I'm pleased to say that in spite of that, I'm still married. Unfortunately, there was, and probably still is, a contract out on my life. A price on my head as high as half a million dollars. For the rest of our lives, my family and I will be looking over our shoulders. I grew up in a city in Italian, knowing what the Mafia was. As a teenager, I played cards, shot craps, played pool, hung around social clubs. I knew that some card and crap games were run by the mob, and some social clubs were mob social clubs. I knew some guys who were mob guys. I knew some of them were killers. Even as a kid, I knew guys that were here today, gone to Mar, never seen again, and I knew what had happened. I knew how wise guys acted. I knew the mentality. I knew things to do and not to do. Growing up in that environment, I could have gone the wise guy route. I knew guys that did. It happened that my mother and father were straight, and I grew up with their values. I grew up as a guy who would work for a living, raise a family, obey the laws. I became an FBI agent. If you were a bad guy, my job was to put you in the can. Simple as that. The late J. Edgar Hoover didn't want his FBI agents to work undercover because it could be a dirty job that could end up tainting the agents. Today, undercover work is a crucial tool in law enforcement. Beginning in the spring of 1976, we had meetings and bull sessions and came up with the idea to infiltrate big-time fences, high echelon dealers in stolen property who were associated with the mafia. Some of these fences were actual mafia members, wise guys themselves. It was decided to make it a one-man undercover job. I was picked because I had just come off another successful operation in Florida targeting car and truck hijackers, because I was familiar with the street world, and not least, because I was Italian. The idea was, you bust the fences, you wound the mafia. That was the extent of our aims in the beginning, just to get the fences. Being a jewel thief was my idea. I needed a specialty that allowed me to work without violence. As a jewel thief, I could say I worked alone. I could come and go as I wanted and come up with scores that everybody didn't have to know about because I committed my crimes in private. As a jewel thief, I would have appropriate expertise. I knew enough about alarm systems and surveillance equipment to assess prospective jobs that I might undertake. A prominent New York City jewelry company gave me a two-week gemology course, knowing only that it was for the FBI and not knowing anything about my operation. I had a name, Donnie Brasco, that I'd grown comfortable with during operations in Florida and California, and I had a criminal career. 
My background was going to be that I had spent time down in Miami and out in California, and I was a jewel thief, a burglar, and an orphan. Without a family, it's harder for people to check up on you. We figured on a six-month operation. Nobody dreamed of going for six years and getting where we got to. Now I had to disappear. For their own protection, my family knew only that I would be going undercover, not for what. Since the Bureau had no history with deep, long-term undercover operations, we had to make up guidelines as we went along. Once I walked out of my FBI office on that September day in 1976, I had to build a new life. I needed an apartment, a car, a bank account, ordinary things. Any slip could be fatal, so everything I did was done by myself, just Joe Blow off the street. I leased a car that fit my role, a yellow 1976 Cadillac Coupe de Ville with Florida tags. Ordinarily, I never wear any jewelry, and I don't care about sharp clothes. But for this job, I had to dress up a little, buy some rings and chains and sport clothes. I opened a bank account and took a one-bedroom apartment just a few blocks uptown from the most chic blocks of the city's Upper East Side. I was ready to hit the streets as Don Brasco, jewel thief and burglar. We had a list of places where wise guy type fences were known to hang out. This was going to be a seven day a week job, going around to these bars and restaurants and clubs. The target places were not necessarily mob joints. Sometimes they were night spots and restaurants owned in whole or part by the mob. More often they were just places where wise guys and associates liked to hang out. I would cruise these places, mostly in Midtown or Lower Manhattan, have a drink or dinner, not talking much or making any moves, just showing my face so people would get used to seeing me. Places like the Rainbow Room in the RCA building in Rockefeller Center, separate tables on 3rd Avenue, the Suvio restaurant on 48th Street in the heart of the theater district. We didn't concentrate on places in Little Italy because I would have been too obvious. You don't just start hanging out in places there without knowing anybody. One of the first places I frequented was Carmelo's, a pleasant restaurant at 1638 York Avenue near 86th Street and the East River, not far from my new apartment. Our information was that the restaurant was owned by Joey and Carmine Zito, who were members of the Genovese crime family, headed by Fat Tony Salerno. During these weeks, in the evening at a bar, I might start off with a scotch. Then I'd switch to club soda for the rest of the night. Occasionally I saw somebody we had targeted, but I never got an opportunity to get into conversation with them. One thing that went on at Carmelo's was backgammon. Men played backgammon at the bar, and some of the wise guys that were hanging around would get involved. I bought a book on backgammon and studied up. Finally, when I thought I was good enough, I decided to challenge for a game at the bar. I won that first game, lost the next, and ended up the evening about breaking even. The important thing was that it broke the ice. I got introduced around as Don for the first time. After a while, I got pretty friendly with the bartender, Marty. He started introducing me to other guys that hung out in Carmelo's, including some of the half-assed wise guys. I began to have a home base where people knew me in case anybody started checking. Yeah, Don Brasco's been coming in here for quite a while, and he seems all right. Never tried to pull anything on us. That's the way you build up who you are, little by little, never moving too fast. Finally, it was time for me to make my move with Marty. Typically, what an undercover cop will do in a buy-bus situation is try to buy something from you. I was going to sell. So I brought in some pieces of jewelry, a couple of diamond rings, a couple of men's and ladies' wristwatches. He didn't ask if the stuff was stolen. He didn't need to, because it was understood. Actually, of course, the stuff was from the FBI, things that were confiscated during investigations. Marty never bought anything from me, but I did place some bets through him, and all of this served the purpose of solidifying my place. An agent friend of mine had an undercover operation going into music business, and had sucked in a couple of connected guys with the Colombo crime family. He introduced me to one of them, a guy named Albert. Connected means that you are associated with mafia members, do jobs with them, but do not share all the rewards and responsibilities of an actual mafia member. 
A true mafia member is a made guy or straightened out or a wise guy. Albert's uncle was a made guy in the Colombo family. I bopped around with Albert and got to know him pretty well. I took him up to Carmelo's a few times so he could see that guys there knew me. It enhances my credibility to be hanging out with a connected guy whose uncle is a wise guy in the Colombo family. The first time I was rousted, I was near Carmelo's. They pulled me over. A couple guys in plain clothes with drawn guns ordered me out, told me to put my hands on my head. They patted me down, checked inside the car. When they were finished, they said it was a routine license check because I had Florida plates on the car. The only thing it was routine for was wise guys because they get rousted all the time. I was tailed a few times, stopped and searched a couple of times. Inconvenience, but it also made me feel I was doing the job right. Things began to happen, some movement. Shortly after the first of the year, 1977, Albert and I went out bouncing, and we went to Hippopotamus, the popular disco at 61st Street and York Avenue. Albert brought me over to a table and introduced me to a Colombo guy that did a lot of business with swag. Jilly, this is Don, a friend of mine. Jilly was maybe five years older than me, average build, five foot nine inches, 160 pounds with dark hair, prominent nose. He headed up a crew that hung out, mainly in Brooklyn. He said I should stop by his store. A few days later, I drove over to Brooklyn to Jilly's store at 7612 15th Avenue in Bensonhurst. The neighborhood was very clean, quiet, working class. The store part was the front room, plain metal racks of expensive clothes, mostly woman's stuff, leather jackets, pants, blouses. Everything was cheap because it was all swag. Jilly's crew hung out in the back room. They were hijackers, burglars, all-around thieves. The store sold their loot. I started hanging out there with Jilly's crew. Because I was known by other people that this crew knew, and because I was introduced to them by somebody they knew, they were pretty open around me. Although these were lower echelon guys in the mob, they always had something going. You name it, they stole it. Jilly's crew would hit warehouses, docks, trucks, houses. There was nothing they wouldn't consider stealing. They considered all the time. There wasn't one hour of one day that went by when they weren't thinking and talking about what they were going to steal. It was easy to get lulled by the daily routine with these guys. Most of the time it was boring. Just under the surface of their routine there was always something lurking that could trip me up. While I was constantly taking mental notes in order to report relevant information to my contact agent, I had to be alert for traps. Most of these guys were, after all, killers. The FBI wouldn't let me actually go out on hijackings and burglaries because the crew went armed. The guys would ask me to go out on jobs with them. I would tell them, hey, packing a gun and all that stuff, that's too cowboy for me. I'll help you out later on with the unloading. And they had enough guys so that adding me didn't mean anything. I wasn't spending all my time in Brooklyn. I kept poking around in other directions. While bouncing around the Manhattan night spots with the Colombo guys, I met Anthony Mira. I knew who Tony Mira was. He was a member of the Bonanno crime family. He had done about 18 years in the can for narcotics and other convictions, and he had only gotten out a year or so earlier. I knew that he was involved in anything and everything illegal to make money. Gambling, drugs, extortion, and muscle of the type that leads to business partnerships. I knew that he was a contract man with maybe 25 hits under his belt. He was mean, feared, and well-connected, a good guy for me to know. I started hanging out with Mira while I was still running with the Brooklyn guys. The Mafia is not primarily an organization of murderers. First and foremost, the Mafia is made up of thieves. It is driven by greed and controlled by fear. Working undercover, I was learning how even the toughest among them feared their superiors. There is a system of hierarchy, rules, and penalties that can terrify the toughest wise guy in the business. Everything is done to make money. Some violations may be excused if you are a good money maker. Murder is secondary, the tool of enforcement, the threat. You can be as frail as was old Carlo Gambino, the last real godfather, boss of bosses, before he died in 1976. But if by a simple nod of the head, 
you have the power of death over anybody in your organization. There isn't a gorilla on the street who won't shake in his ballet shoes before you. The five major mafia families are based in New York. Gambino, Lucchese, Genovese, Colombo, Bonanno. Joe Bonanno took over the family in 1931. He was forced into retirement in the mid-1960s. The Bonanno boss when I went undercover was Carmine Galenti. The commission, on which sit the bosses of the families, resolve inter-family disputes or matters that transcend the interest of a single family or allows for cooperative ventures such as controlling the concrete industry in New York or skimming the take from the Las Vegas casinos. The commission also has to approve the execution of any boss by either a faction of his own family or by anybody else. Beneath each boss in a family, each level of the chain of command requires total respect from those below. Each family has an underboss, a consigliere, counselor, who mediates disputes and advises the boss, and a number of captains. Under each captain are the soldiers, the lowest level of made guys. In any family, there may be, say, 200 made guys and 10 times as many connected guys who are associated with the made guys but are not themselves made. If you are a connected guy in partnership with some soldier or captain, you are subject to many of the same rules as everybody else in the family. You have to give respect. You have to share your profits. But they don't necessarily share with you, and you are not entitled to the same respect and protection given to made guys. I was already identifying a lot of guys in the Colombo and Bonanno families and pinpointing their ranks. Whenever you pulled a score, you had to give a cut of it to whoever you were responsible to above you in the chain of command. Along with the strict chain of command and the requirement for respect for those above you, there was a strict code of discipline. The consequence for not adhering to the rules of profit sharing and respect was not getting kicked out of the mafia, it was being whacked out. I was learning how it felt to be part of this system I was learning to act accordingly. I was becoming ever more known and trusted, was in on their plans and activities, and so had to start abiding by the rules myself. I was in at the bottom. The only people lower than me by mafia reckoning were ordinary citizens with nine to five jobs and no mob connections. Anthony Mirror was the nastiest, most intimidating guy I met in the Mafia. He went about six foot two, 210 pounds. He was a good money maker and a stone cold killer. He was moody and unpredictable. You never knew what might set him off. Mirror was a knife man. It was common for mobsters to carry knives instead of guns because they were often rousted by cops and didn't want to be caught with guns on them. Being caught carrying an unregistered pistol in New York means prison, but it was not common for everybody to use their knives the way Mira did. I was often told, if you ever get into an argument with him, make sure you stay an arm's length away, because he will stick you. Even among mafioso, Mira was far from normal. We were at a bar in Fort Lee, New Jersey. Tony was talking to some guy on the other side of him, and I was listening. I moved my elbow and knocked over my drink, spilling it on the guy on my other side. Sorry, I say. Sorry don't clean my coat, the guy says. Why don't you assholes go back to New York where you belong? Hey, I said, I'm sorry. I get a bar rack from the bartender and wipe it up. Now this guy gets a drink, puts it on the bar, and knocks it over on me. Take your dumb ass across the river, he says. Nothing's going to appease this guy. I see Tony listen to this, getting that cuckoo look in his eye, his hand in his jacket pocket. Mira may be on the verge of pulling out his knife to stick this guy. I have to end it quick. I say, you want to step outside? Yeah. He gets up off his stool, and I give him a shot right there. Another guy jumps in. Mira smacks him. The first guy comes at me again. I clock him with a bottle. We scram before the cops come. Why don't you just stick the cocksucker, Tony says. I was going to do it for you. Embarrassed? Yeah, I was. Here I am, an FBI agent, a 38-year-old man getting into a bar fight. I didn't even want to be in that joint with Anthony Mira. 
but because I was, that's the kind of thing that can happen. Often on Friday and Saturday nights, we hung out at Cecil's. I learned that Cecil's was one of the joints Mira had muscled in on. The owners paid him a weekly cut, a salary for the privilege of having him around. Sometimes he'd tell me to watch the bartenders and managers to make sure they weren't clipping the joint. I was sitting at the bar at Cecil's. A friend of Mira's, a guy I didn't know well, came up behind me to pat me on the back and say hello. He ran his hand down my back. What the fuck are you doing? I said as softly as I could manage. He grunted and walked away. I knew what he was doing. He was checking me for a wire. I saw him talking to Mira. Later I was in the men's room washing my hands. When I turned around, I bumped into the same guy. He quickly slid his hands down the sides of my jacket. I pushed him away. I think you got the wrong guy, pal, I said. I just left him standing there. Mirror was always hustling broads. Women were attracted to him, even though he treated them like dirt. He was never married, but he had a load of girlfriends, everything from bimbos to movie stars. When he wasn't hustling them, he was abusing them. He was just totally obnoxious. When a woman at Cecil's complained that her umbrella had been stolen out of the coat room, he said to her, You think I care about a fucking umbrella? The thing for you to do about it is to get the fuck out of here and don't come back. Psychologists could probably have had a field day with Mira. For my part, he was a dangerous and necessary pain in the ass. Mira says to me, Drive me uptown. What's the problem? I got to meet a guy that owes me money. He was collecting on one of his Shylock loans. We drive to a restaurant on First Ave. We go in and stand at the bar. Pretty soon this guy walks in, tough looking, about 30. He comes over to Mira and starts to open his mouth. Don't, Mira says, holding up his hands. Don't mention anybody's name or I'm going to smack you right here. My protocol is that if the guy says he talked to another wise guy about the situation, mentions another wise guy's name, then Mira would first have to talk to the other wise guy. So he wasn't giving this guy a chance to mention anybody's name. Mira says, let's take a walk. Now I'm worried. If Mira takes him out, this guy could end up in the alley next door. Mira would beat him up or stab him. It was one of those situations where as an agent, I had to intercede. I say, hey, Tony, why don't you let me talk to this guy? Save you the aggravation. I'll take him out for a walk. He nods to me and shoves the guy toward the door. I take him outside. I say, look, I just saved you. I don't want to see you get killed, but next time it ain't going to be that easy. When we go back in there, you say, Tony, can I meet you tomorrow and give you the money? And you better have it for him tomorrow because I might not be around tomorrow. And you act scared like I gave you a couple smacks because that's what I'm supposed to do. This tough guy is practically licking my hand because of his fear of Mira. We go back in and the guy goes right up to Mira and says, Tony, I'll give you the money tomorrow. Meet you anywhere you want. Okay? Okay? The kid convinced you? Mira sometimes called me the kid. Tomorrow, right here. Lefty Ruggiero had a little storefront social club similar to dozens of others in Little Italy. Coffee, booze, card tables, TV. Downstairs was another room for more serious card games. Members only, men only. Associates of Lefty and the Bonanno family only. It was a place to hang out. In the back of the room was a phone and table. A place to take bets. Lefty was a bookie. Sometimes Mira wasn't there and I would bullshit with Lefty. Chat about sports and what teams were hot to bet on. I began placing a few bets on baseball and horses and on football when the pro exhibition season started. $50 to $100 just to help me be accepted. We started to develop a relationship. Lefty started calling me Donnie instead of Don, and that's what everybody called me from then on. The daily routine at Lefty's was not much different from what it was at Jilly's in Brooklyn, except that it was more of a real social club, not a store. After about two weeks, Lefty asked me how I made money. By then I felt comfortable, not like I was rushing anything. So I told him, I was a jewel thief and burglar. My son-in-law Marco was in that line, he said. 
Maybe you guys can get some things going together. I usually work alone, Lefty, I said. But if there's a good score and I like it, there's always a possibility. For a while, it was like a testing period. I just bided my time and didn't push my nose into anything. Lefty started hitting me up for loans every now and then. I would lend him 300 125 Sometimes he'd pay me back a fraction of it. I knew it was part of the hustle. You squeeze money out from whoever you can. Also, my lending him money was an indication that I was making money. So as not to seem like a patsy, I never give him all he asked for. Lefty suggested I come down to the club some nights. There were crap games or three-card Monty games in the neighborhood. Some of them were heavy duty. Mainly, I just watched. Guys could be winning or losing 100000 Too steep for me on an FBI budget. Lefty ran the bookmaking operation for Nicky Marangello, the underboss of the Bonanno family. He began regularly having me drive him around to make collections and payoffs on the betting operation. His fortunes varied widely in the betting business. A couple of weeks ago, I got beat thirteen grand for the week, he said. Last week, I booked fifty-two grand, and my losses were only seventeen fifty. One afternoon, he had to run off somewhere, and he asked me, You want to handle the phone while I'm gone? So I started taking bets over the phone for Lefty. Lefty was very different from Mira. He talked a lot and was excitable. He had a big reputation as a killer. But on a daily social basis, he wasn't as likely to inflict damage. Lefty and Mira were both soldiers, but under different captains. Mira was under Mickey Zaffirano until he died. Lefty was under Mike Sabella. Sabella owned a prominent restaurant on Mulberry Street, Casa Bella. Occasionally, we went there for dinner. Lefty introduced me to Sabella, a short, paunchy man with baggy eyes. Mike, this is Donnie, a friend of mine. Nicky Marangella, the underboss, stopped by Lefty's club regularly. Called Nicky Glasses or Little Nicky or Nicky Cigars, Marangella was a small man with slick back hair, thick glasses, and a sharp nose. He never smiled. Because of his thick glasses, he seemed always to be staring. Lefty introduced me to him. Nicky, this is Donnie, a friend of mine. Marangello owned his own social club called Toyland. It was Mira who first took me to Toyland at 94 Hester Street on the outskirts of Little Italy and Chinatown. Toyland wasn't the same kind of social club as Lefty's. It wasn't social. Guys talked to Nicky one at a time. Others waited outside. Mira pointed out some of the guys hanging around Toyland, and he referred to them as Zips. He said the Zips were Sicilians, being brought into the country to distribute heroin and carry out hits for Carmine Lilo Galenti, the boss of the Bonanno family. The Zips were effective because, although they were in the family, they were unknown in this country. No police records. They were set up in pizza parlors, where they received and distributed heroin laundered money, and waited for any other assignment from Galenti. Unlike the American Mafia, Zips would kill cops and judges. The FBI knew there were Sicilians showing up, but until then we didn't know who was behind it or what these Sicilians were being brought in for. Several years later, my information on the Sicilians was put together with other intelligence, and a full-scale investigation was launched. It resulted in the huge pizza connection case in New York in 1986, the largest international heroin smuggling case ever. Eventually, Lefty started sending me to Toyland to report on weekly bookmaking operations to Marangello. There was no chit-chat, but I noticed that Marangello was looking me over. Other people were looking me over, too, though I didn't know it then. In separate operations... Both the New York Police Department and the FBI had Toyland and Casabella under surveillance during this time. I showed up in their surveillance photographs. The NYPD identified me as Don Brasco, an associate of the Venano Organized Crime Family. Lefty and Mira both saw me as a potential good money earner, so jealousy developed. Why are you so friendly with that fuck Lefty? Mira would ask me. He can't do nothing for you. That mirror's a crazy rat bastard, Lefty would say. He's nothing but trouble. You shouldn't be spending time with him. It was a dangerous game, 
being in the middle between these two guys, I thought that eventually I would have to choose, but as it turned out, I didn't have to. One afternoon, I walked into the club and Lefty said, Donnie, I put in a claim on you. I went on record with Mike and Nicky. You're my partner now. Hey, Lefty, that's great, I said. Now, Donnie, this means that you have to start really listening to me, going by the rules. I'm responsible for you. You're responsible to me. I hope everything you say about yourself is true, because if you fuck up, we're both going to go bye-bye. Lefty began what he called his schooling of me. It began right away and never stopped. Lefty was fastidious. He told me to shave off my mustache and cut my hair. No real wise guys wear mustaches, he said, except some of the old mustache peats. You gotta look neat, dressed right, which means at night you gotta throw on a sports jacket and slacks. He told me I have to show respect to all family members. That's the most important thing, he said, respect. The worst thing you can do is embarrass a wise guy. If you embarrass a captain or a boss, forget about it. You're history. When you're around a captain or boss, you didn't speak or join in the conversation unless asked to. Now, when a wise guy introduces you to another wise guy, he will say, Donnie is a friend of mine. That means Donnie is okay, and you can talk in front of him if you want. But he's not a made guy, so you may not want to talk about certain business or family matters in front of him. That's the way I introduced you, see? When a wise guy is introducing another made guy, he will say, He's a friend of ours. That means you can talk business in front of him because he's a member of La Cosa Nostra. He told me that my activities had to be cleared through him and any proceeds I made had to be split with him. You didn't use last names unless absolutely necessary. You didn't mess with a wise guy's wife or girlfriend. Since I was now a connected guy but not a wise guy, I was not to argue or talk back to a wise guy or to raise my hands to one. When you're not a wise guy, Lefty said, the wise guy is always right and you're always wrong. You observed the code of silence about the family. You didn't put business on the street. You keep your nose clean and don't fuck up, he said. Obey the rules and be a good earner and you'll be proposed for membership one day. Occasionally I was still spending time with Tony Mirror. Lefty whined about it, but as long as I split with him any proceeds of anything I did with Mira, it was okay. Mira was a late-night person anyway, and Lefty was not, so I could manage them both. I didn't want to cut myself off totally from Mira unless and until I had to. I was out bouncing with Mira and a couple other wise guys and their girlfriends. About four in the morning, we went for breakfast. Suddenly, Mira turns up noxious with the waitress bitching about cold eggs and bad service. He cranks it up, getting nasty or making a scene. Finally, I say, quietly, Hey, Tony, she's doing the best she can. That sets him off worse. He leans across the table and says, You shut the fuck up. You don't ever tell me what to say or not to say or how to act. I don't mean to, Tony. I just thought maybe you could ease up on her. Then he launches into a tirade in front of everybody. You fucking jerk off. You're nothing. You know that? You've got no power. You got no say. You think that fuck lefty's gonna protect you? You're with me here, and you keep your fucking mouth shut if you want to keep breathing. I had to shut up because it was only going to get worse and go totally out of control. So I say, Tony, you're right. I probably was out of line. But inside I was seething. I'm on the job here at four o'clock in the morning, doing the best I can in my role. Tired, missing my family and I have to take this shit in front of people in a restaurant? I had never allowed anybody else to talk to me like that in my life. If you're not a wise guy, you don't talk back to a wise guy. You don't raise your hands to a wise guy. But I risk seeming like a patsy. This guy is talking to me like I'm a nitwit, and on the street you have to command a measure of respect no matter who you are. The next day I find him at his luncheonette on Madison Street. I say, Tony, let's take a walk. We walk up Madison Street. Outwardly, I'm casual. But inside, the adrenaline is pumping. There are people on the street, but that won't help me if it goes bad. I am thinking about his temper and his knife. I say, Tony, I realize you're a wise guy and I'm not, and that you command a certain respect for being a wise guy. Yeah, he says. 
But I'm telling you now, don't ever embarrass me in front of people again. Because I'm not just some fucking Joe scumbag on the street, Tony. And if you keep doing it, one of these days, I'm going to get you for it. And it'll be when no one else is around. I wait for his reaction. We keep walking. Ah, uh, you're okay with me, he says at last. I like you. Then don't embarrass me. As far as I'm concerned, right now everything's forgotten. Nothing ever happened. We have a new start. That was the end of the conversation. He peeled off and went back to his luncheonette. He never mentioned anything about it, but there was an edge between us after that. He never forgot. Not long after that, Mira went on the lam. He snuck out of town in a Volkswagen. He was wanted by the state on another narcotics rap. They caught up with him after about three months, and Mira was back in the can. He was sentenced to eight and a half years in New York's Rikers Island prison. Lefty said, See how tough he is with those niggers out there. I was through with Mira for a while. Besides Lefty's bookmaking operation, there were all kinds of scams and schemes around, little ones and big ones. These guys might pull off a $100,000 score one day, rob a parking meter the day after. Anything where there's a dime to be ripped off. The key was in the number of scams. $200 isn't a lot, but if you're hitting up 50 scams for $200 apiece, you're making some money. We had counterfeit credit cards and stolen credit cards. You could always beat those once or twice before it got hot. They would go in with these cards and buy a lot of electronic equipment that they could sell. A guy named Nick the Greek regularly supplied Lefty with manifest of cargo ships docked over in Jersey. Lefty would have stuff stolen to order. He showed me the manifest so I could check through them and see if I wanted to buy anything. Radios, luggage, clothes. He and his crew could provide all kinds of phony documents. He had a guy in the Department of Motor Vehicles who supplied him with blank driver's licenses. You just had to type in the information. One guy paid Lefty $350 for six phony New York State driver's licenses and six phony social security cards. For selling a beef between owners of a company at the Fulton Fish Market, Lefty and two of his associates were given 20% of the ownership plus a salary of $5,000 a month. It's a shame, he told me after meeting with the other owners at his club, that my shares couldn't be put in my name. Wise guys didn't like to show income or ownership of anything. The cars they drive are almost always registered to someone else. Lefty didn't file income tax returns. Like most wise guys, Lefty Guns with Jerio still lived in the same neighborhood where he was born and raised. He lived in a big old apartment complex called Knickerbocker Village on Monroe Street, a few blocks south of Little Italy. A lot of wise guys lived in there, including Tony Mira. Lefty invited me up there often. Lefty's apartment was a small one-bedroom on the eighth floor, overlooking the interior courtyard of the complex. He loved tropical fish and had several tanks of them. He had a big color TV and a VCR and a cable connection into which he had tapped illegally, like all the wise guys, so it was free. He didn't have air conditioning. Lefty hated air conditioning. On the hottest, most humid days, he wouldn't let me turn it on even in the car. He chain-smoked English ovals, which made the air everywhere he was worse, especially for a non-smoker like me. He was a great cook, any kind of food. I would go over there to eat a couple of times a week. Lefty had been divorced for a long time. His girlfriend, Louise, was a nice girl from the neighborhood. I got along good with Louise. She put up with a lot. Lefty had no sensitivity and sometimes treated her badly, just like he treated everybody else. But at the same time, he was protective of her and quite faithful. She had a full-time job as a secretary. You develop feelings for people, even in this job. Some of those people develop feelings for you, too. While you are allowing this to happen, you know that in the end, they are going to be hurt by what you are doing, and they don't even know who you really are. Lefty had four grown kids. I got quite close to Lefty's kids, really became a friend to them. They would come to me with their problems. 
His son Tommy, who was about 28, also lived in the building. He was a thief and had done some work for the family. Basically, he was a freelancer, but he also had problems with heroin. He was an on and off junkie. Lefty was continually asking me to talk to Tommy, get him straightened out. He wanted me to help keep him off drugs and to get him to settle down to work. Sometimes Tommy and I would be in Lefty's club in the early afternoon watching our favorite soap operas, like All My Children. Lefty would come in and see that and throw a fit. Turn off them fucking soap boxes, he would bark. You should be out stealing and looking for business. Come on, Donnie. Get Tommy busy on the street. You see, Donnie, I can't write this. If I could do this, I could, I, I could do it tomorrow morning. I could practice. I'm not a good fucking swell. I won't be well, you got to go too. You got you to gotta practice the handwriting, Terry. I know. You got to practice the handwriting. Get it down, practice it. And then you can just fucking walk it anywhere. You don't need to go around. I know that. That's a fucking, that's some kind of a handwriting, that one. I know I'll fuck it up if I do it, Donnie. Yeah, I'm not good at fucking hands. I know I'll fuck it up. So, I mean, I'm terrible, I'll tell you that right now, with this kind of shit. I'm trying to think of a fucking show where I can know somebody. You gotta go with some kids or something. Yeah, I know. You can't go get a, young, uh, a, a guy, you gotta get a young kid working. I thought he had a score. This fucking thing, this is more harder to me than a fucking score, this fucking thing. Two of Lefty's daughters were married to wise guys. One had the misfortune to be married to Marco. I met Marco at the bus stop luncheonette, Mira's place. Besides being a jewel thief, Marco was supposed to be an expert, safe, and lock man. He was also a drug dealer and a loudmouth. Other than a few conversations about jewels, I never had much to do with Marco. He lived a flashy life, vacationed in Florida where he had a big boat. He boasted that he could move all the dope that anybody could provide him. When I met Marco, he was worried about his partner, Billy Paradise. Billy has turned stooly, Marco said. Lefty was also worried about Billy Paradise. We got to think about having that guy whacked, he said. I'd like to take him on my boat and throw him to the fishes. I ever tell you that story, Donnie, about the guy that thought I was going to whack him on my boat? No. One day I asked this guy to come out with me in my boat, you know, in the East River, my speedboat. He came along, but he kept watching me, wouldn't turn his back to me. Finally, I said, you dumb bastard. If I wanted you whacked, I wouldn't have bothered bringing you out in my boat. I would have hit you downstairs at the club while you were playing cards and rolled you up in a rug and dumped you in the river right at South Street. That's what we do with stoolies, I told him. He was looking at me. I didn't know if he was just telling me a story or if he was giving me a message about what happens to informants. Well, I hope this guy, Paradise, don't rat anybody out, I said. One day, Marco just disappeared. The word was out he got into skimming drug profits that were supposed to go to the organization. He was never found. Word on the street was that the contract had gone to Lefty to whack his own son-in-law. But Lefty never said anything about it. Give me a call. What is Tony doing about this guy? Left. What can you do about the guy? You know, I can't. I can't get there. I grab him by the throat. Well, if I start smacking him around, you know. I didn't say smack him around, but grab him by the throat. Give me the number. That's all. I'll take care of him. All right. Well, you take care of it. I'm coming out next Friday. How could you take care of everything? You ever do a hit on anybody, Donnie? Lefty asked. I never had a contract, if that's what you mean. I killed a couple of guys. One guy in a fight, another guy that fucked me out of his score, and we got into a beef. That ain't a hit. If you kill somebody, you kill somebody. What's the difference? No, Donnie, you don't understand. It ain't that simple. That's why I gotta school you. Hitting a guy in a contract is a lot different than whacking a guy over a beef. On a beef, you got to rage about the guy. But on a contract, you might have no feelings one way or another about the guy. It might not even concern you why the guy is getting hit. you got to be able to do it just like a professional job, with no emotion at all. You think you could do that? I don't see why not. Yeah, well, we'll see. 
A lot of guys think it's easy. Then they freeze up and can't do it. Generally, you use a 22 caliber. A 22 caliber doesn't make a clean hole like some bigger calibers. Just right behind the ear. A 22 ricochets around your skull. Tears everything up. Next time I get a contract, I'll take you with me, show you how to do it. What would I do if and when this situation came up? My decision was that if it came to it, if the target was a wise guy and it came down to whether it was him or me, it was going to be him that got whacked. If it was an ordinary citizen, then I would take the risk and try to stop it. By midsummer of 1977, I was really becoming accepted and trusted and can move around easily. I knew most of the regular wise guys down on Mulberry Street. Not only Bonanos, but guys from other crews. I was given the familiar hugs and kisses on the cheek that wise guys exchange. I could come and go in any of the joints I wanted. I could move in and out. All during this time I was passing on to the Bureau more intelligence about the structure of the Bonanno family and other families, how they operated, who was who, and what rank, information on the Mafia nationwide, intelligence we've never had before from an agent on the inside. The thing is, Donnie, you got to keep your nose clean, Lefty told me. You got to be a good earner and don't get into trouble. Don't offend, don't insult anybody, and I'll propose you for membership. Now, the only thing is, they might give you a contract to go out and whack somebody, but don't worry about it. Like I told you, I'll show you how. You got the makings, Donnie. You're going to be a made guy someday. Lefty says, come on, we've got to go up to Sabella's. It's a hot July night. We go to Casabella, but we don't go in. There are five or six guys standing outside in the sidewalk. Guys I recognize as being under Mike Sabella. We stand on the sidewalk with these other guys. I ask Lefty, why the hell are we standing here? We're out here to make sure nothing happens to the old man. He's in there. The old man is Carmine Galenti, the boss of the Bonanno family. He just recently got out of prison. I look in the restaurant window, and I can see him sitting at the table reserved for big shots. He's hawk-nosed, almost bald, has a big cigar in his mouth. Sibella and a few others are seated with him. What's the big deal, I say? What's going to happen to him? Things are going on, he says. There are a lot of things you don't know, Donnie, things I can't talk about. You don't know how mean this guy is, Donnie, Lefty goes on quietly. A lot of people hate him. They feel he's only out for himself. He's the only one making any money. There's only a few people that he's close to, and mainly that's the Zips, like Caesar and those that you see around Toyland. They're as mean as he is. There's a lot of people out there who would like to see him get whacked. That's why we're here. So here I was, an FBI agent, worried about getting whacked myself on this sidewalk on Mulberry Street because I was trusted enough by these mobsters to be standing guard over the feared boss of the Bonanno family. The Bureau had started other undercover operations around the country. We could use my new mob credentials to establish credibility of other undercover agents in some of these other operations. I could be brought around to vouch for these other agents, attest that they were good bad guys. Bad guy targets of these other operations would check me out. I'm a friend of lefties in New York. It would be easy for me to do this if I wasn't based in New York City, under Lefty Stum and I on a day-to-day -day basis. If I moved someplace else while remaining Lefty's partner, I could more easily slip around to these other undercover operations without having to ask permission to go out of town and without having Lefty knowing of my every move and questioning me about it. Also, I could bring Lefty out to these other operations, introduce him, Hope that he might horn in, establish a link with the Bonanos that would form a conspiracy under the law. I could still regularly come back to New York for two or three weeks at a time, continue to develop my association with Lefty, and maintain the partnership. The other consideration was my family. Earlier, I hadn't been too concerned about protection of my family. I would get home to our house in New Jersey maybe one night every ten days or two weeks. I was also careful and covered my tracks. But by the fall of 1977, I was beginning to think that if I continued to get deeper into the mob, eventually my family was going to have to move away. 
there was always the chance of momentary carelessness that could be disastrous. The FBI then had 52 offices throughout the country. They gave us the choice of five areas in which to relocate. My wife and I picked an area. For me and my colleagues in the Bureau, there had been no expectation that this job would go on so long. Now there was no guess at how long it would continue. What started with the idea of getting to fences had become penetrating the mafia in Little Italy and now had evolved to me representing the mob in other places. The FBI had a couple of situations in San Diego and Los Angeles that they wanted me to look into. I told Lefty I had decided to go back to California, where I had supposedly spent a lot of my earlier jewel thief life for a while. You know, Lefty, I said, I'm not making all that much money here right now. Why don't I go out there and start making some good scores, you know, and come back and forth? You could even come out there, hang out for a couple weeks, see if we couldn't get something going. He thought it was a good idea, so I took off for California. From then until the spring of 1979, I used my mob connections to help the FBI establish other undercover operations around the country. I spent the longest time in Milwaukee, assisting a friend, Agent Tony Conte, set up a sting operation aimed against the Mafia family headed by Frank Balistrieri. By using my connections with Lefty, Mike Sabella, and eventually Bonanno underboss Nicky Marangello, Tony and I maneuvered a small vending machine company into partnership with Balistrieri. He was the first Mafia boss I ever met. I even went to dinner at his house. The operation gave the FBI the evidence they needed to prosecute Balistrieri, but they couldn't do it immediately without compromising my undercover role. In the meantime, the FBI didn't want to run a vending machine company. Agent Conti supposedly skipped town without making payments due to myself, Lefty Sabella, and Marangello. Since I had introduced Conti to the Bonanno family, I was blamed. But I wasn't punished. I was put on probation. Mike Sabella gave me the cold shoulder. But since I wasn't a made guy, I was excused for a couple of errors in judgment. Lefty never let me forget how I let Conti and $200,000 get away. For the next few months, I moved around the country, ostensibly checking out scores for Lefty and me. I was in Miami in July when Lefty called and told me to go out and buy the New York papers. You'll be in for a big surprise, he said. This guy here says that uh, we're run by the Gambino. They got my name in it? No, no, no. The banana, he said, is uh, after the last hits. He said uh, I was doing the game next week. Want to read it? Carmine Galenti had been hit. When I used to stand guard for him with lefty outside Casabella, I worried about getting whacked. Now there was the Bonanno family boss on the front page, lying dead on his back in a pool of blood, his cigar still clenched in his teeth. He had been shotgunned to death by three men while having lunch in the rear courtyard of Joe and Mary's Italian-American restaurant on Knickerbocker Avenue, the street where their zips hung out in the Bushwick section of Brooklyn. Two other guys were identified as having been with Galenti at the lunch. Galenti's bodyguards, Baldo Amato and Cesar Bonaventure, two of the Zips I had seen around the Toyland Social Club. They had fled after the shooting. I called Lefty. Wow, I said. There's going to be some big changes. Well, where do we stand with everybody? I can't talk over the phone. Come in right away. I met Lefty on Madison Street outside the candy store. Rusty Ristelli is the new boss, Lefty said, even though he's still in the can. We're going to be under Sonny Black. He was made captain. He's taken over Mike's crew. Dominic Sonny Black Napolitano was with the Brooklyn Bonanno crew. I had seen him around once or twice, but for the most part, the Brooklyn guys hung out in Brooklyn, the Manhattan crew in Manhattan. Sonny had been in prison for hijacking most of the time I had been on this job. What about Mike, I asked. Sibella and Marigello accepted the motions. Now they were just ordinary soldiers of Lefty's rank. They were lucky. They were both supposed to get whacked, but they got passes because a lot of people liked them. So where does all this leave us, I say? We got no problems. 
I thought I was going to get whacked. But Lefty's meeting with Sonny had been friendly. Sonny told him all that had happened, who had been knocked down, who the new captains were, and so forth. Joey Messina, the fat guy I had seen hanging around social clubs, was made captain. Sal Catalano, another Toyland guy, was made street boss of the Zips, the imported Sicilians. And Cesar Bonaventure, the slick young Zip who was with Galenti when he got whacked, was made captain. At 28, the youngest in the family. Sonny gave Lefty a choice to go with him or with Joey Messina. But Sonny wanted him. So I says, yeah, I'll be with you. A wise guy does not go around asking who clipped the boss. I didn't want anybody saying, why was Donnie so curious about everything? The murder of a boss doesn't get talked about much on the street. Business policy doesn't change. There's only one policy in the mob. You earn money and you kick your money upstairs. Only the personalities change. And ordinary wise guys or connected guys don't have anything to say about that. When Rusty gets out of the can, Lefty said, things are going to be different. He liked Philip, Rusty Rustelli. They were old buddies. I had never seen Rustelli because he had been in the can since 1975 for extortion. It was strange walking down Mulberry Street past Casabella and realizing that Mike Sabella was no longer a power. For a time, Lefty said, nobody would be making any big moves. He was back to his check scams and numbers rackets. Meanwhile, I had some freedom to move around. I told Lefty I had to start making some bigger money, so I wanted to check out a few things here and there. I worked short stints on various Bureau undercover investigations, ranging from New England to the Southwest. Some of these operations came to nothing. Some I can't talk about. Lefty and I spent a lot of time around Miami, vacationing, losing money in Hialeah or the dog tracks, looking for deals. Miami was considered more or less open territory, like Las Vegas, where the different mob families could operate so long as nobody stepped on anybody else's toes. Lefty was always scheming about how to crack into Florida where the big money was. Lefty and I were in Miami in August when a bunch of guys came down from New York for a vacation with their wives or girlfriends. They kept talking about how nice it would be to have a boat and go for a sea cruise. This was during the time that the undercover sting operation that became known as Abscam was underway. Eventually, several congressmen would be caught taking bribes from agents posing as rich Arabs. For the operation, the FBI was using a boat to entertain their targets. Called the left hand, it was a white Chinese-made yacht, one of only two or three such models in the world. It had a full-time captain on board. I happened to know the agent working at Abscam. His undercover name was Tony DeVita. I got in touch with him and explained what I had. A bunch of wise guys and their ladies who would be very impressed if I could take them out on that boat. I asked him if Abscam was going to break any time soon, and if not, if the boat could be available. He assured me that nothing would break publicly on the case for a long time. I told the guys that a girl I had been fooling around with up in Fort Lauderdale had introduced me to her rich brother, who owned a fancy boat. They went nuts when they saw it, especially Lefty, because he was proud of how his partner could produce for the crew. What a fucking boat, he says. Donnie, you did some fucking job getting a boat like this. Everybody was ooing and on as we went on board. Where's your broad, Lefty asked me. The one with the brother. She couldn't make it. I did, however, bring along another guy. As a favor to another agent running another operation, I introduced an undercover policeman into my mafia crowd. The cop's undercover name was Rocky. Bringing along Rocky on the cruise helped establish him with some of the bad guys he might be running across in his operation. Out on the ocean we went. We cruised around all day, ate and drank, and had a wonderful time. A couple of people had cameras, and everybody enjoyed posing with everybody else. It was a great day. Afterward, I just put Abscam and the boat out of my mind. An agent going by the name of Tony Rossi was in Florida trying to infiltrate the gambling business that might lead to a connection with the Santo Traficante family. Traficante, who had been operating out of Tampa for 25 years, was the biggest mafia don in Florida. He ran gambling casinos in Havana 
until Castro came to power and achieved a lot of public notoriety when he admitted participating in a CIA plot to assassinate Castro during the Kennedy administration. Rossi got a job as an enforcer, a strong-armed guy protecting card games. After a few weeks of this, Rossi and his supervisor, Tony Daniels, decided that things weren't moving fast enough. Tony Conti joined Rossi, adding his experience from our operation against Balistrieri in Milwaukee. They came up with the idea of opening a nightclub. The operation using the nightclub as a way to get to Trafficante was codenamed Project Coldwater. In the fall of 1979, they rented a club in Holiday in Pasco County, 40 miles northwest of Tampa, on busy U.S. Route 19. It was a building on five acres that had been a tennis club with six tennis courts. They named it King's Court. Rossi was established as owner. So that King's Court didn't have to deal with the liquor authority, it was a private bottle club that you could join for a membership fee of $25. People brought their own bottles and left them in little lockers behind the bar. They paid for setups. The front door had a peephole and signs saying King's Court private lounge, no blue jeans, members and guests ring bell to enter. They started running poker games out of a back room in the club, the house taking 5%. They paid off a member of the Pasco County Sheriff's Department for protection. They managed to entice in some local hoods who dealt in swag and drugs. Some half-assed wise guys began hanging out there, ex-Chicago guys, ex-New York guys. They indicated that they had big connections, maybe leading to trafficante, but nothing happened. Conti suggested that maybe I could bring the Bananos in and get something going with trafficante. A liaison with the Florida boss, allowing them to operate in the area, would be just as interesting to the Bananos as it was to us. Of course, because of our operation in Milwaukee, Conti had to pull out. His past had caught up with him. From the fall of 1979 through February of 1980, I gradually cultivated Lefty about King's Court. I told him a guy I had known from Pittsburgh had opened up a nightclub, and he wasn't connected with anybody, and he was getting hassled by half-assed wise guys. There was a possibility that we could move in. Lefty was interested. How much money can we get from this guy, Donnie? Lefty asked me. We got to get at least five grand on my first trip, because first I got to get permission from Sonny to come down, and if he gives me the okay, I got to give him 2500 Then out of the other 2500 I give you your end. Yeah, I'll make sure. But I tell Rossi, Tony, we aren't giving him five grand up front. Most we give him is two grand. He'll push, but don't worry about it. In March, Lefty made his first trip down to King's Court. Rossi and I picked him up and took him to Pappas's restaurant, a popular Greek place in Tarpon Springs. Donnie Lefty says, Tell Tony to tell me what the situation is. I asked Rossi to tell him. He tells Lefty about the club, the card games, the half-assed wise guys around the club. He says that a couple of ex-New York guys named Jojo Filippelli and Jimmy Aquafrida did some jobs around the club and talked about having heavyweight contacts. They talk about being New York wise guys, but they don't come up with anything, Rossi says. I want to get some things going, maybe over in Orlando, too, because I got a DA in my pocket. But I don't want these guys to move in on me because they can't produce. Since nobody put up any money and you got no partners, Lefty says, that means you and I can form a partnership. Anybody ask, you say I invested 15 grand in this joint. The rule is, once a wise guy puts money into a club or operation, he is a partner, and no other wise guy can muscle in, because he'd be taking the earnings from another wise guy. That's the protection you have with a wise guy partner, the peace of mind you pay for. We went down to King's Court and sat at Rossi's round table in the back. Rossi brings Aquafrida over to the table and introduces him. Supposedly he's a tough guy but his face is flushed and he seems nervous when he sits down opposite Lefty. I'm here for a few days, Lefty says, to visit my old friend Tony here, my partner. I just put a bundle of money into this club. Tony can tell you about that. I'll come down here once in a while to make sure everything goes smooth. 
I got 16 guys in my crew in the Miami Lauderdale area. They'll be keeping an eye on things too. Any problems about the club? I can be contacted in New York. Aquafrida nods respectfully and returns to the bar. Jojo gets the same treatment. You won't be bothered now by nobody, Lefty says to Rossi. He turns to me. Okay, Donnie, let's talk about money. Tell Tony how much money is he going to give me. Tony and I go outside. Whatever we say he makes in a week, Lefty's going to take half. We have to give him enough to keep him interested. If we played it right, I knew Lefty would bring Sonny Black down and we'd have a chance of getting something going with Santo Traficante. We stay outside enjoying ourselves long enough to have discussed this. Back at the table, I say, Lefty, he takes 500 a week, and he says he'll give you 250 a week. Okay, tell him that I'll accept 250 a week, which he should mail every Wednesday so I get it by Friday, plus the 5,000. But Tony and I agreed only to give Lefty 2,000. Finally, reluctantly, Lefty accepts that Tony does not have 5000 to give. The partnership is made, and the conversation becomes more normal. You got peace of mind now, he says to Rossi. Lefty says he will contact the right people to clear the way for Rossi to expand operations into Orlando and other parts of Florida. Lefty went back to New York. A week later, the day after Easter... Sonny sent him back down to dictate an official partnership agreement. Tony's got to understand one thing. He's got to put money aside. In other words, what is he taking on? 300 a week? He takes down 250 a week, two and a quarter. Got to put it aside. We got to come out there. Now, suppose I want to come out there and they send it to you guys the same coming week. <laughs> you understand? Yeah. The hotel is $30 a night. He's got to lay it aside. He has to. Me, 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 I'm talking about. I I'm understand. Your I'm your man. That's what I want you to put across then. See, the question is this. Here's the gimmick. You can't cry poverty your, 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 your people. I'm his partner, you're my partner. Oh. We share alike. You come to my home, we share it. I come to your home, you got to share it. Forget about this bullshit business and stuff like that. We were establishing ourselves in King's Court as part of the local underworld scene. Rossi was taking me around and letting people know that I was his New York guy. I had to prove myself right away to both New York and Florida people so that I could have freedom to operate. He took me to a restaurant called Joe Pete's Riverboat. Joe Pete was an ex-New Yorker, a half-assed tough guy who bragged about his connections and his Italian food. He also ran a gambling operation. We sat down in the restaurant and we're eating when Joe P. came over from the bar. Tony, how you been doing? Good to see you. Rossi says, Joe, like you to meet Donnie. He's my new partner. He's from New York. Oh, yeah, Joe Pete says. He went into the who do you know that I know game. I had a cold and my voice was hoarse. Rossi and I kept eating. Joe Pete says, geez, Donnie, you don't sound too good. I don't feel too good. Maybe it's from your food. What do you mean? I felt good until I started eating your fucking food. Now I feel like I'm going to die from this meal. He got very offended. Why do you say a thing like that? I say what I got to say. Your fucking food. I feel like I'm going to die from it. He got up. Maybe you might die from something else. Nah, just the food. We got a reputation. Out of the local woodwork came drug deals, swag deals, and connections. Lefty called from New York. He said that Sonny was very happy with how things were going with King's Court. He was so happy with the prospects that he was coming down to see it for himself on April 6th. Meeting Sonny Black was going to be a big test for me. I was better known now, considered more experienced and responsible, with fewer excuses for making mistakes. Sonny was a very important captain in New York. He had a reputation for being unusually tough and savvy, even for a mafia capo. If I gave him any doubts at all, the whole case would come to a halt. If I played my part right, I might gain direct access to him without having to go through Lefty or anybody else, as I had to with Mike Sabella. Rossi and I met them at the airport, Lefty, Sonny, and Sonny's girlfriend, Judy. Lefty says, Sonny, Donnie? Sonny and I kissed each other. I say, 
Sonny, this is Tony. He's with me. Tony, Sonny. Sonny shook Rossi's hand. We took them to Malio's restaurant in Tampa for dinner and then to King's Court. Sonny in his late forties was a sturdy five foot seven inches, about 170 pounds, with a powerfully developed chest and arms. On his right arm was a tattoo of a panther. He was swarthy, with hair he dyed jet black. His face was fleshy, with rings under the eyes that made him look, depending upon his mood, either tired or menacing. When he fixed his dark eyes on you, either in anger or to give an order, he could freeze anybody. Everything dark about him got darker, and nothing was soft. Yet, in contrast to Lefty, Sonny had a laid-back style. He radiated confidence, control, and power, but not arrogance. He noticed everything. I paid close attention to everything he said. He had a reputation for personal loyalty, a guy who would kill you in a minute if you crossed him. After a tour of King's Court, Sonny took me aside to a table apart from the others. Donnie, before I came here, I did some checking. Talked to some guys from downtown that know you. They say good things about you. Lefty says good things about you. They tell me you're the kind of guy you do your business and keep your mouth shut and don't bother people and don't make a scene about anything. You're a good earner and you're not flamboyant. I like that. From now on, you can report to me. You don't have to report to Lefty. I'm flattered. What do you want to do down here? Maybe some bookmaking and Shylocking? Good. Our people in New York will back it. How much do you need to start a Shylock operation? Maybe twenty-five grand. We'd also like to move into Orlando. When we're ready here, then we can go into Orlando. Donnie, remember this. We can all earn. When we're doing business among friends, we all share everything equally, and we don't try to cheat each other. We got an army up in New York behind us. Nobody can bother us, as long as we conduct ourselves in the proper manner. Sonny's approach to me, telling me I could report to him, put me in a difficult position. If I had been a legitimate bad guy, I would have jumped at the chance to hook up directly to a captain and rise up the ladder. But as an agent, I couldn't jeopardize the operation. If Lefty got angry with me, he could have engineered a squelch of the whole King's Court deal. First thing the next morning, I sat Lefty down and told him what Sonny had said. But I'm still going to be loyal to you, I say. Anything I do with Sonny, I'm going to run it by you, because you and me started together. I'm happy you say that, Lefty says. But who does this guy think he is if he thinks he can take you away from me? He ain't got no right to you. The next day, we all lounged around the pool at the Tahitian, and Sonny continued to encourage plans. He wanted us to have a Las Vegas night, a popular event where the gambling is supposedly for charity. Once we have a Vegas night, Sonny says, then it becomes ours. Nobody else can have it. Start lining it up. I'll send wheels and stuff down from New York. We decide to have our first Las Vegas night on Friday, May 9th. Sonny sent down a roulette wheel, blackjack tables, cards, dice. We made up a sign saying that the proceeds would go to the Italian-American War Veterans Club. Captain Joseph Donahue of the Pasco County Sheriff's Office made one of his regular visits to the club. Donahue said that he would stay on duty during Las Vegas night to make sure there was no trouble. Rossi gave him $200 for the visit. We set up the club as a game room. In another room, we had a long table with a free buffet, cold cuts, salads. Sonny came down with Lefty and a couple of pros Sonny provided to work the games. Maybe 200 people came to that first Vegas night. Rossi had paid off the cop, Donahue, $400 to make sure we weren't hassled. We went all night. Sonny was pleased with the crowd and the performance and the few G's that he walked away with. It would help lead to a meeting with Santo Traficante. He said we should make a deal with owners of other clubs, that we'd run Vegas nights in their clubs, and they could keep the liquor sales and a piece of the Vegas money. Sonny wanted us to try a lot of things. He asked me if I had any cocaine or marijuana connections in the area, because he wanted to increase his sources. He wanted us to keep our eyes open for outlets for plywood, paint, and counterfeit designer jeans that he had access to. 
He wanted me to check around and see if a numbers business would be a good idea, and if it was, he could send a guy down from New York to run it. I've already got a book set up for the football season, I say. I'm going to talk to Rusty about putting some family money in here, he says. I want to bring Stevie down to look at it, because he's handling the money for the family. It'll probably take a couple of weeks to get it. You'll have to pay it back at one and a half points. Steve, Stevie Beef Canone, was a consigliere of the Bonanno family. Naturally, I would welcome a chance to meet him. When we were alone, Sonny says, What's going on with Lefty? There's something wrong between him and Rossi. The night before Las Vegas night, we had all gone out to eat, and Lefty had invited some of the hostesses from the club. He ordered several bottles of expensive wine. Then he stuck Rossi with the tab. Sonny didn't like that. I have to be careful about what I say. I don't want him to think I give up a guy right away. On the other hand, maybe it's a good time to put a clamp on Lefty. I lay it off on Rossi. Well, Sonny, Rossi's been complaining to me that Lefty's bleeding him too much. He doesn't mind the 250 bucks a week, but all the other stuff, meals, trips. Tell Rossi that other than the 250 he doesn't give Lefty any more money. You tell him he's only to answer to me. Okay, I'll tell him. I didn't say anything to Lefty. I didn't want Lefty to dump Rossi, which he could have done easily. I couldn't appear to be ignoring Sonny's directive either. Rossi and I would just have to make it seem that Lefty had backed off on the money thing. Sonny was joined in holiday by his right-hand man, John Booby Sarasani, who came down from New York. Booby was taller and leaner than Sonny, balding at the temples with a hawk-like face. He was quiet and smart a chess lover. He was one mean fucker, very closed mouth, a hard guy to get to know. If you got him to talk to you, he was all right. Sonny wasn't close to a lot of people. Booby was his confidant, capable of doing whatever was needed, which included watching Sonny's back. I trust Booby, Sonny says, and that's it. The FBI had had Santo Traficante under surveillance for some time. With the prospect of bringing the Bananos together with Traficante, Project Coldwater continued with surveillances and added electronic devices at King's Court. The club had hidden videotape cameras that could monitor the office and the private roundtable in the main room that Rossi used. There were bugs in the chandelier over the roundtable and in the telephone. Rossi's car had a Niagara tape recorder hidden in the trunk. I moved into a one-bedroom, second-floor apartment in a complex of four-story buildings called Holiday Park Apartments, directly across Route 19 from King's Court, where Rossi also had an apartment. From my window, I could see King's Court. My telephone was wired for recording. On occasion, Rossi or I would wear a wire, either a Niagara tape recorder or a T4 transmitter. Sonny called and told me that he and Booby were flying down for Memorial Day weekend. I called Lefty to tell him. That set him off about his turf. What do you mean Sonny's coming down tomorrow? I don't know. I asked him if he had talked to you because I wanted to make sure you knew about it. He said, don't worry, there's no problem with Lefty. I'll see him tomorrow before we go. I don't believe this fucking guy over here. This is my fucking operation. Left, I'm going to be with you, you know that. Ain't the question. Why is he coming down here? Maybe he wants to come down for a vacation. Don't give me that fucking bullshit maybe he wants. He ain't supposed to be in that town without me. Who's paying for his fucking plane fare? I guess we are. But he said he'll straighten it out tomorrow. Who the fuck are you to accept confirmation on his plane ticket? Lefty, I'm going to argue with him? Yeah, you cocksucker. I hung up on him. He calls right back. You fucking motherfucker, you don't hang up on me. I can imagine his veins bulging. Don't ever call me cocksucker, Lefty. I'll call you what I want. I call you a cocksucker, eh? I hang up. He calls right back. Let me talk to Tony. I give the phone to Tony. That fucking son of a bitch cocksucker better understand who he's talking to. Nobody treats me that way hanging up. Lefty, I don't know what you're talking about, Tony says. Let me talk to Donnie. I get back on the phone and he resumes. I told you nobody goes on the expense sheet. 
You tell that motherfucking Tony that he owes me $500 and he sends me $500 or more. I'm going to shoot that motherfucker in the head. There's something wrong over here, pal. I'm going to Brooklyn tomorrow, and I'll have all the answers. Who's your fucking boss? You are. When I get through with Sonny right then and there, if he can't give me the right answers, I'm going to tell you something. What? Ain't nobody knows that I got three fucking grenades. Ain't no motherfucker could ever live after I get through with them. If this guy gives me the wrong answers tomorrow, I'll blow the fuck everybody up. Sonny and Booby came down. They sat with Rossi and me in the lounge at the Tahitian. I had a nagger in my boot. I don't want to get caught in the middle with Lefty, I say. I spoke to him, Sonny says. See, when I say to you, don't say nothing, don't say nothing. Lefty stood up for me when I was away, and I never do anything to hurt him. He'll go all the way with you. He's a tremendous guy, a dynamite guy, but he tends to dramatize. So you don't tell him nothing. I'll tell him what I want him to know. I'm never telling him what conversation take place. He knows me too long. I never do anything underhanded. If I take down any money from here, he gets his end and he goes home to sleep. He's done a lot for me too in six years, I say. But I don't want to have arguments with him over you. Anything we do, I'm always going to give him a piece of my end. I don't want him to think that I'm fucking him. Donnie, you know the story with this crew. When I went away, they put me on the clothesline. I know. When Sonny was in the can, his crew had deserted him. He was separated from his wife, but he had four kids he wanted taken care of. Money supposed to go to his family wasn't paid. They didn't want to bother with me, this crew, but when the boss told him to keep his fucking mouth shut about me, Lefty stood up. Now we all got the power, so I brought him right back. He's a stand-up guy. There ain't no two ways about it. But you can't tell him nothing. He gets them two fucking wines in him and then, well, he's trying to help you, but he's hurting you. Rossi left the table for a few minutes. Sonny opened up more around me because Rossi was still considered an outsider. A few days earlier, Donahue, the deputy sheriff, brought up the matter of dog racing tracks with Rossi. He wanted to know if Rossi's people might be interested. Some politicians would have to be bribed. I brought it up with Sonny. He wants to help him put it together, and for protection, so nobody else is going to muscle in on it. We could definitely protect this guy, down to the track. We got to bring in another family, because that family controls over there. That's what I think he's looking for. Yeah, I'll get that. Let's hear what Tony's got to say. He waits for Tony to return to the table. We're talking about the dog track. Rossi nods. He came to me because, you know... You couldn't run a track here in Florida without Traffic Candy's permission. That never came up directly. That's what I read into it. He thinks I could, you know, reach out. So what he's really looking for is the permission. Or somebody, I say, that can go and sit down with the guy in Tampa. All right, I'll lay it down to him when I see this guy. See what he says. If the guy says, all right, go ahead, then you just go ahead. Nobody will ever bother us. But if he says, listen, I got three, what do I need four for? Then forget about it, because you've got to show him respect. Sonny came down with his girlfriend, Judy, and Lefty, and checked into the Tahitian Motor Lodge. Sonny had to wait for a call. Traficanti would say when and where they would meet. We hung around the pool. The next day, he got the call. He was to meet Traficanti that night at 8. He wanted me to pick him up at 6.45. I like to get there early, Sonny says, and get the feel of the place. Look it over to make sure it's not a setup or there aren't any cops. A top banano captain was meeting with the biggest boss in Florida. The FBI put a surveillance team on. I took Rossi's car because it was wired with a Niagara in the trunk. I picked Sonny up. Lefty was not with him. We're going to Pappas's, he says, indicating the restaurant in Tarpon Springs. At about 7.15, we went into the restaurant. We sat at the bar and had a drink. Sonny scanned the place casually. How's this guy going to know you, I asked. I met him up in New York last week. He was up there. Stevie knew him from years ago. Stevie introduced me to him. At about 7.30, Sonny says, Okay, Donnie, you leave. Go back to the club, and I'll call you when it's time to pick me up. I walked out. Going through the parking lot, 
I passed right by Trafficanti and another man heading toward the restaurant. Trafficanti was such a quiet-looking old gentleman, shoulders slightly hunched, calm old face. It was odd to think of him as what he really was. Sonny called at ten o'clock. I met him in the lounge at the restaurant. We had a drink before we left. I didn't say anything about having seen Trafficanti. He's a dynamite guy, Sonny says. He likes me. We got whatever we want. All the doors are open to us in Florida now, just so we do things properly. A 50-50 split. If we fuck up, Donnie, the old man will shut every door on us. One of the things we should start looking at, he said, was bingo. He's big in bingo, but he doesn't have any in Pasco County. Big money in that. So the guy tonight, nice guy to talk to, huh? It's like me and you talking already, Donnie. That's great. He says, you got something? We'll work together, he says. Well, everybody's going to be making the money, right? Right, bro. We were both happy for the same reason, more or less. I felt deeply satisfied for having engineered a marriage between two mafia families. The next day, Trafficanti's man, Benny Usyk, a short, white-haired guy, came to see Sonny about the bingo operation. Afterward, Sonny said that Benny ran Trafficanti's bingo parlors. He said that we would start looking for sites with Benny, and that we had to get a building of 8,000 to 10,000 square feet with air conditioning. An old supermarket was perfect. He said that we would supply the location and half the money to open it up. Trafficanti would supply the equipment and know-how and the other half of the money. Sonny handed me $5,000, 50 $100 bills to put on the street for the loan sharking operation. He instructed us to keep the VIG, or interest, and reinvest the capital until it was built into $60,000 to $80,000. Then the split would be me, him, Booby, and Lefty, with Rossi getting a smaller share. For the time being, he says, don't make no loans of more than 500 bucks. You send 200 a month to Steve to pay back the family. Rossi and I recorded the series year and serial numbers of the bills and turned the money over to the case agents. Sonny, Judy, and Booby came down for the 4th of July weekend. On July 4th, Sonny had another meeting with Trafficanti. Rossi and I drove Sonny over to Britain Plaza in Tampa, where Trafficanti had one of his bingo parlors, which his man Husick wanted to show us. Husick took Sonny to the meeting. After his meeting, Sonny joined us at the Jack in the Box restaurant. He was in good spirits. He said that Trafficanti liked the dog track idea, and he told Sonny that he would line up an attorney and an architect. They would be straight people, so we shouldn't discuss mob business with them, Traffic County had told him. We gotta get things going, Sonny says, because the old man is expecting things to happen. There's so much fucking money in Florida that if the old man dies, I'll move right down there and take over the whole state. He said he was giving up 15 soldiers in New York, assigning them to other capos so he can concentrate on the big stuff in the Florida operation. We took a breather. Sonny, Booby, and I drove out of town to where they had water slides. They give you a little mat to sit on, and you climb the stairs 50 or 60 feet in the air and slide down this thing, maybe going 20 miles per hour, and you splash into a big pool at the bottom. We went down every which way, on our bellies, on our backs, making trains by locking hands and ankles with each other. We must have spent three or four hours going down the water slides, laughing like kids, taunting each other on who could go fastest. On Sunday, Sonny, Judy, Rossi, and I took a ride to Orlando so that Sonny could scout the area where he wanted to set up bingo and bookmaking operations, now with the support of the Trafficanti organization. Then we went to Disney World. It was the first time Sonny had been any place like that. We spent the rest of the day, went on all the rides, visited the museums and exhibits, fooled around. We went to a shooting gallery where they had rifles and moving targets. Sonny was a pretty good shot. But Rossi and I were knocking the hell out of everything. You guys are fucking better shots than I am, he says. Where'd you learn to shoot like that? He could relax easier than Lefty could. Lefty was mafia 24 hours a day. Mafia business was always intertwined with everything Lefty did with me. He would never let his guard down. Despite the fact that Sonny was more powerful and more dangerous, it was a relief to be with him. In restaurants or in public, he was a gentleman, not a loudmouth. I didn't have to carry his bags. Away from mob business, Sonny was just a regular street guy who could laugh and break chops. No business was discussed when we were having a good time. 
His girlfriend Judy was a good kid, a straight girl, sharp. She didn't know much about what he did. He never involved her in anything of the business. She was his main girlfriend. He had met her when she was tending bar at Casabella. She was another one of those outsiders that I was sorry about because of what would happen down the line. I got to explain to you how you stand, how to act. Well, that's what I want to know. I want to know, you know, who are well, you? Well, what the fuck? You know, you know, what am I telling you? In other words, what am I telling you? I've got, I can't tell you on the phone. I don't want you to come up here. I know. I don't want to hear it on the phone. Right. I don't want to hear I'll tell you phone. where to go on the beach, who to go see. But when I do come down to Tampa, what do we go for? Not, you know, just about happens. Let me finish what I was saying. You know, five, six pitches? Yeah. Uh, that's $5, $10. <laughs> we'll go to the hotel, right? Mm hmm We're going to eat? Now, uh, who's the first guy to go home? You, all the time. Thank you. So now, I've got beautiful information. You know, that's what somebody wants me to do. But he's trying to eat for no words in my mouth. Yeah. yeah. So put him, pin him down. All right. <laughs> And send that guy in the morning, but I want to be out, uh, notified at midnight tonight. What do you guys to say? Sometimes Sonny and I would arm wrestle. He lifted weights, so did I. He was strong, but I had the advantage of leverage, being taller and having longer arms. We would be sitting around the pool or someplace when he would challenge me. He could never beat me. It drove him nuts. I never saw him challenge anybody else, but he never stopped challenging me. Since we were now dealing with Traficante, we wanted to keep King's Court clean relatively. We didn't want to attract more attention than necessary to the club as a gambling place. So we opened up another club for the card games. It was just a small store at 1227 Dixie Highway, a couple of miles away. Sonny gave me $500 for the security deposit. We took the card tables out of the back room of King's Court and sent them down there with the poker dealers. And that's where the nightly games continued. We got to do things right, Sonny says. The old man says he has 500 men down here and they're not pulling their weight. He's looking for new blood in this state, and that's us. Sonny was shuttling between New York and Florida for meetings with Traffic Canty, solidifying his position. On August 8th, he and Lefty came down. Sonny called me at the apartment and said for me and Rossi to be at the coffee shop at the Tahitian at 3.30 in the afternoon. That guy is coming, he says. Rossi and I went to the coffee shop. Sonny was sitting at a table with Traficante and Husey. He motioned for us to sit at another table by ourselves. Half an hour later, Sonny came over and told Rossi to make dinner reservations for three at the Bon Appetit restaurant in Dunedin. You guys go up to Lefty's room, he says. Lefty's room was next to Sonny's. Lefty was lying on the bed watching TV. Rossi got on the phone as instructed. I was standing in the doorway. Sonny and Traficante came walking by. Sonny motioned for me to come into his room. Inside, he introduced me. Donnie, this is Santo. Santo, Donnie. Santo looked at me with narrow eyes through thick glasses. I shook hands with my second mafia boss. Sonny wanted me to come to New York to update him on all the various rackets we supposedly had underway. Bingo, numbers, gambling. I went to his neighborhood for the first time. The Withers Italian American War Veterans Club, Inc., Sonny's private social club, was at 415 Graham Avenue at the corner of Graham and Withers Street in the Greenpoint section of Brooklyn. The neighborhood was quiet, safe, and clean. Mostly small shops and storefront businesses in two-story or three-story apartment buildings. It was similar to the neighborhood in the Bensonhurst section to the south, where I had been involved four years earlier with Jilly's crew and the Columbos. One of the main similarities was that both neighborhoods gave you the feeling that outsiders would be noticed quickly. The Withers Club had a big front room with a small bar and a few car tables, and a back room with a desk telephones, a sink, and the men's room. Diagonally across the intersection at 420 Graham Avenue was the Motion Lounge, another private hangout for Sonny and his crew. In the front room of the lounge was the bar, a large screen projection TV, a pinball machine, a couple of tables. Behind the bar was a big tank of tropical fish. Sonny said I shouldn't bother with the expense and inconvenience of a hotel. I should stay at his apartment. That was on the top floor above the Motion Lounge, a three-story walk-up. It was a modest, utilitarian, one-bedroom place. 
you entered into a hallway with a small kitchen to the left, a dining room ahead, and a living room with a pull-out sofa bed to the right, and Sonny's bedroom off that. There were no doors. A sort of ladder-like set of stairs led up to the roof, where he kept his racing pigeons. He didn't have air conditioning in the apartment because the building wasn't wired for it, and the heat that night was brutal. He kept the windows open, which looked out over the adjoining roof. I slept on the pull-out couch in the living room. He slept in the bedroom. I fell asleep on my back, sweating. I woke up. Something touched my chest. At first in my days, I thought it was hands, fingernails feeling from my neck. Somebody was going to strangle me. But it was claws. A rat? I froze, afraid to open my eyes. Sleeping in the apartment of a mafia captain didn't bother me at all. But I am terrified of mice or rats. Now I was going to get bitten by a rat and die of rabies. I held my breath while I counted down. Then I swung my hand with everything I had and swatted across the room. The rat thudded to the floor as I hit the light switch. It was a cat, I glimpsed, leaping for the window and disappearing into the night across the rooftops. Sonny came running in. What the fuck happened? I told him. He started laughing like a son of a bitch. Big tough guy, scared of a fucking cat, he says. What will I tell everybody this story? At about 6.30 he woke me up. He had already been to the bakery across the street to pick up pastry and had made coffee. We sat around his kitchen table in our underwear, drinking coffee and bullshitting about the business. He had weights and a weight bench in his bedroom. We lifted weights together. We went up on the roof so he could show me his pigeons. He was proud of his racing pigeons. He loved to spend time on the roof. He had three coops. Both the roof of the building and the roof of his coops were topped with miniature white picket fences. He said he did some of his best thinking up on the roof taking care of his pigeons. He talked about mob politics. He hinted that the power struggle was heating up within the Bonanno family. The whole thing is how strong you are and how much power you got and how fucking mean you are. That's what makes you rise in the mob, he said. When we were around our mob guys, Sonny acted like a captain and commanded respect. On the street and in other business situations, you could see that he was not only respected, but feared. But here, when nobody else was around, we just shot the breeze like two equals. He gave me my own key so that I could use his apartment any time I wanted, whether he was there or not. Sometimes he stayed at Judy's apartment on Staten Island. From then on, I stayed at Sonny's almost every time I came to New York. When I went back down to Florida, I sent Sonny a pair of ceiling fans for his apartment. He sent me a big package of canned squid, Italian bread, Italian cold cuts and cheeses because he knew I loved those things and I couldn't get the best New York type stuff where I was in Florida. One afternoon we're in the coffee shop at the Tahitian. I feel strong today, he says. So what does that mean? I feel strong enough to beat you at arm wrestling. Sonny, you never beat me. What's going to make today any different? How strong I am. Come on. In here? Come on. We put our elbows together on the table and go through all the gyrations of getting ready. Lock our hands in. You ready? He looks me in the eye. Yeah. I'm going to beat you. Go ahead. Go. We strain our arms together. Then he spits in my face. I flinch and he slams my hand down. I didn't tell you how I was going to beat you. Tony Mira got out of prison. When he was in the can, guys kept reporting to Lefty that Mira was calling people 
and was pissed off because he had heard that Lefty and I had made a ton of money in Milwaukee and were making a ton of money in Florida. And some of that should be his because he brought me around to the crew in the first place. Lefty tells me, I told him, you better have friends when you come out. I says, you better stop knocking people around, knocking their brains out. Some of Sonny's crew in Brooklyn were arrested, and it looked like there was a snitch involved. Lefty called to tell me everybody knew was suspect. In other words, he tells me over the phone, who's responsible has to die. They're not worried about Tony, are they? Let's put it this way. You're not, I'm not, but they are. We gotta go to his background. Okay, we got Rocky around us too. Rocky, the undercover cop I helped introduce into the mob world for a separate operation. The one who had gone on the boat trip with us had a car business not far from New York City. I helped Rocky set up this business as a cover. When Tony Mirror got out of prison, he started hanging out with Rocky. That put Lefty in a bind. Since I had introduced Rocky to him, Lefty felt that Rocky belonged to him and owed him a share of everything he did. At the same time, Lefty didn't want to have anything to do with Mira. He's hanging out with that stool pigeon, Lefty says, meaning Mira. I don't know what you're going to do with him. I don't know what's going on. This guy does something wrong? Donnie, you and I are going bye-bye. I know this guy is going to send us to our death. I got to talk to you about it. It put me in a bind, too, because I didn't know what was going on with Rocky and Mira either. I'll give him three pistols to my one. And I'll beat him. Lest I know that. What mother said, he gives it up. He's a stone son of a bitch. He's a pimp. Low life son of a bitch. But well, who did they, who, who, who the hell ended up taking him? Nobody took him yet. Nobody wants him. Jesus Christ. Nobody wants him. How can he make so much fucking trouble if nobody wants him? Ain't the question. Just come out of the can. Oh, I see. Fucking fag. Stone fag. And that's it. In other words, they're giving him respect because he just got out of the can. No, you don't get the, you don't demand it. You got the respect for what he is. That's what I mean. Nothing else. Because yeah. Mother can. Guys, they still want to know how he come out. Yeah, I like to know, too. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> That's a big secret, right? See, I want to meet him for one reason I want to meet him. You point the phones out, you got a stool pigeon around you, you admit it to 14 different wise guys. The 13 wise guys don't know I'm calling them down. But I can't meet him to say that. Yeah. He doesn't know what I'm talking about. Yeah. But this son of a bitch is ducking me. One night, Sonny and Booby and I were at Creasy's Restaurant, not far from the club, at 593 Lorimore Street. It was a favorite place of ours. They loved Sonny. Sonny and everybody with him was treated royally. We wouldn't even use menus. We'd order whatever we wanted, and they'd make it. I'm pleased with how you're conducting yourself down there, Sonny says. What you're doing, the book, the Shylocking. You're independent. Don't have to be told what to do. You're not always coming and asking me for money, like a lot of guys. Thanks, bro. The books are going to open up for membership at the end of the year. I can propose five guys, which I got already. Booby is number one. Then I'm obligated with four other guys that are relatives of family members. But the next time the books open up, Maybe next year, you're going to be the first guy that I propose. Hey, Sonny, I really appreciate that. That's what I was looking for. That was the truth. Obviously, no agent had ever become a made guy undercover in the mafia. What I could accomplish as a made guy was unbelievable. He didn't mention that Tony Mirror was raising a stink over me, insisting that I belong to him and not to Lefty, and demanding a piece of King's Court. I wasn't supposed to know that because this was mob business and I wasn't a made guy. Lefty told me as a favor. Sonny knew, but he didn't say a word. The ab scam scandal broke. Arrests were made. The story was all over the news. I didn't pay too much attention to it. I was too busy trying to dope out the power struggle within the Bonanno family. I was in Miami with Lefty and a bunch of the guys. At three or four in the morning, after a night of bouncing around, one of the guys suggested that we go to Nathan's for something to eat. I started to sit down with them. Lefty grabs my arm. Sit over here at this other table. I want to talk to you. We sat at a table over in the corner. Donnie, what do you know about that boat we went out on? I started to answer when it hit me what he was driving at, and at the same time he whipped out a folded page from Time magazine 
opened it up, and slapped it in front of me. That's the boat, Donnie. I was stunned. There, as part of the story about Abscan, was a picture of the left hand, the boat we had partied on, and a description of how the FBI had used it in the sting. My life was on the line right here with how I handled this. Gee, I don't think that's the boat Ron left. Don't give me bullshit, Donnie. One thing I know is boats. We went out on a fucking federal boat. I'll tell you this, Left. If that's the boat, we were in good company, and we were better than they were. Huh? That fucking guy with the boat. He scammed congressmen and senators, and he tried to scam us. If he can scam those people, I ain't no five better kappa that he can't scam me. But he didn't get a fucking thing on us, right? We had a great party, and we walked away from it. You sure? Hey, did they get us? We're sitting here, Left. We beat those FBI guys. I don't know, Donnie, he says. He keeps shaking his head and looking at the picture. I hope you know who the fuck you're messing around with. A fucking federal boat. Lefty called me at my apartment. Tony Mirror was causing trouble. He had gone to the boss and put in another claim on me. Mirror said that I had worked for him at Cecil's Disco when I first came around, and that entitled him to claim me. There's going to be a sit-down on this at Prince Street. Sonny and I have to go to the table and straighten this whole thing out. That's this afternoon. Left, no way I'm going to be with Mira. You ain't got nothing to say about it. Around the middle of March, informants were telling the FBI of unusual activity on Prince Street in Little Italy. An apparent series of sit-downs was taking place at 20 Prince Street, the social club owned by Bonanno Consigliere Steve Canone. I gotta control my temper, Lefty says over the phone. You have no idea what we went through. This went on for fucking eight days with this motherfucker for you. I mean heavyweights had to sit down. Saturday was the meeting in New York. I had a four and a half hour meeting about you again today. For what? Don't say for what. How come you never tell me? I don't even know what you're talking about. I'll tell you what, you son of a bitch fucking asshole that you are. You got me aggravated about this Rocky. Mirror was always trouble, and now Rocky. The undercover cop's name was coming up too often. That there were sit-downs over me involving Mirror and Rocky was not good news. What about Rocky? Anthony Mirror says that you shook Rocky down and you's made it 250 grand in excess amount of fucking junk money. Lefty's voice was barely controllable. I'm fed up with this bullshit over here. Out of the blue... I was being accused of secretly splitting up a $250,000 drug deal with Rocky. Next to being a snitch, the worst thing you do is not split a big score with your bosses. I didn't know what Rocky was involved in. I didn't know what, if anything, he was really telling Mira. I couldn't risk trying to contact Rocky because I couldn't trust his phone, and I wasn't sure I could even trust him. I didn't know what kind of situation he was in. I had to handle this conversation very carefully but I had to react with bad guy strength. I couldn't be pushed around. Rocky's lying, Left. I never cut any junk money with him. But your word doesn't count. Why does his word count? Rocky already said it. Just because he said it first? This son of a bitch passed a remark. You only get a denial. This thing has snowballed. It's a very, very dangerous thing. Now it's beyond Sonny. It's out of Sonny's hands now, your case. It's going all the way to the top. I got sent for it today. Sonny didn't tell me what he wanted to talk about. Then when I was there, he says, Sally's coming down. Sally Ferrugia, the acting boss. All of a sudden, Mira walks in with two guys, give a kiss and all that. Sonny, don't warn me what's going on. Another big sit down. I warned I'm not giving you up. I'd die with you. If the old man was out, we'd have no fucking problem. Sally can't say nothing. He feels bad, but his hands are tied. He can only listen to people, and they're all making up stories. I went at Mira today. I got up from the table, and I went at Mira at the end of the bar. I called him all the cocksuckers in the world. Mira's captain. Visualize the guy that was in the papers where the old man went bye-bye. He put his hand on me. Mira's captain was Caesar Bonaventure, the zip who was one of Galenti's bodyguards when he got hit and one of those we figured was in on the hit. I says, Get your hand off me. He says, You know who you're talking to? I don't even know you. The whole joint heard it. 
I'm no fucking mutt, I says. Sonny says, you're supposed to listen. I had a big fight with Sonny. I stuck to my guns. Nobody in Brooklyn could control me today. You're not allowed to drink at a meeting. You know what four and a half hours is sitting down with politicians? I know. No, you don't know. The fucking trouble with you. Well, you never explained to me. I can't explain to you. What I'm telling you now, you ain't supposed to know. See, you're treated like a friend, understand? Now, did you bring Rocky in town? This was the most delicate and dangerous subject. That's right. I met him in Lauderdale at the bar down there. I told you that at Pier 66. Donnie, we ain't saying different, but now you came in with him. You gave him the job. Remember what you say now. You put the guy there. Somebody put him there. The guy that put him there was on the federal boat. The guy is a federal stool pigeon. Something's wrong with that joint. This was Lefty at his most dangerous. He circled around, jumped here and there. But when he was onto something wrong, he wouldn't let go. Now he was circling around the truth, which was something that could get Rocky or me killed if it wasn't handled right. You put the guy there, Donnie. Now who owns that joint? I don't know who owns it now, Left. Donnie, who owned it before? Who's Rocky working for? You can't answer that question? It's a serious thing. Where does this go, Donnie? Left, I don't know. Listen, Lefty says, I'm asking you a question. The man admitted you made $250,000. Why would he rat you out? That's because Mira put words in his mouth. Could you prove it? How am I going to prove it? Because he's probably scared of Mira. That's the only reason. He's a fucking stool pigeon bastard. I won you and I'm going to keep you. I says, I go all the way and die with the kid. Ain't nobody having you. I don't like what Sonny did. He wants to compromise. He wants to give up Rocky for you. Sonny says, we own Donnie and we're giving up Rocky. You give up my prick, I says. I don't want Rocky, but he can't have him. Mira's a fucking swindling bastard. He's on the payroll out there, you know. He's out there every day from 8 to 3 in the afternoon. Just tell me about Rocky and make me feel happy and go to bed with a clear head. Who put him there, Donnie? I hesitated, trying to think three questions ahead. How to slip out of this noose about my involvement with Rocky and the car business. I just told you, he came up from Florida with me. Donnie, don't stutter to me. Ain't the question. You was the boss there. He admitted that. Everybody in the neighborhood knew it. You was the boss. Who owns the company? Left, I told you, it was a guy in California. A guy opens up a motherfucking Corvette joint with all new cars. You don't know his name? Left, there were three cars there. They closed that joint. All they're doing is running swag out of the back. Rocky told me. Oh, come on, swag to pay that kind of rent? What are you, playing games? Are you a fucking nitwit? The idea is, who put everybody there? Where did it all stem from? Where'd you meet? How come Rocky mentioned to Anthony Mira about junk money and don't mention the boat? The stool pigeon boat. The FBI boat. How come Rocky don't mention the federal boat? You got caught in the web, Donnie. You're my friend. I trust you an awful lot. Many times I had doubts about you. You don't understand the ins and outs of anything. So what do we do now? We just let this guy bullshit and lie to everybody? Ain't the question. I didn't want to scare you from coming in. Hey, Left, I ain't afraid of anybody. You can't help me out. I have to handle it without you. I ain't afraid of Mira either. Lefty gave me a low chuckle. Let me tell you something. Get off your fucking high horses. You're fucking aggravating me. How'd the Sonny stand tonight? He's not giving you up, but he's not on your side. In other words, anything happens, I take the weight. Why ain't you blowing your top? Why ain't you mad at Rocky? I am. I was. I should never have brought Rocky in. I bent my rules to do a favor because I didn't know Rocky. Now it was haunting me and I wanted to strangle him. One guy's going to check both of yous out. Hey, Left, you know they got no problem checking me out. Donnie, you told me you put Rocky there and these things are going to come out. You got anything fucking hidden? I got nothing like that. Just promise me one thing. From here on in until the longest day you live, you swear on yourself that you'll always abide by my rules. I swear on anything, Left. 
Now, will you face the guy? That's right. I was making a risky move. I wanted to attend a sit-down, which is restricted to made guys. I didn't want to face Rocky because I didn't know how jammed up he might be and what he might say, how much that might endanger us both. But I gambled that Mirror wouldn't produce Rocky at a sit-down. Why should I be the fall guy? Tell me now, because you're in Florida. If you got any fucking faults, go where the fuck you gotta go. I don't have any left. Let's go after him. Go to the table and call them liars. You can't call them liars, Donnie. You're involved with 14 heavyweights now, going on for two weeks. Why don't we just kill Mirror, that's all. Get it out of the way. No, 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 no. We don't do that to friends. That's what he's trying to do to us. That's all right. He's doing that legally. Now I'll leave it up to Sonny, what he wants to do. I'll get back to you. All right? It won't be now, maybe a week from now. I just want you to understand that I feel I'm doing the right thing. Only wish you could give me the right answers. When I hung up, I felt isolated. I didn't know what Mira was going to do. I didn't know what Rocky was going to do. I couldn't go to New York. I had to wait it out. Well, then how come he keeps, you know, opening his mouth up? Well, he, went, he wants my head in the sense with the, with the, with the boys. Yeah, I know that. Well, who, he wants who, you kept lowered. Well, who was at the, uh... Everybody. Who's, but they who, gave him wrong. They called him a rat soul pigeon bastard. He wasn't was, was he at the, at the sit-down yesterday? Yeah. Sonny Black was there, too. No, I mean, uh, was, was Mirror there? Yeah, he was there. They called him a rat soul pigeon bastard. Mm. Well, Nicky was... You can't get out left you, you rat him out. Now, you know what the bad for me, little Nicky? Nicky was there too, huh? Oh, yeah. He was with us, right? That's right. He told us, you can't get satisfaction with Lefty, you read him out. And if Lefty made the one with Tiles. It's not his business, is it? They didn't concern you. But I'll tell you one thing about Lefty, he said in front of everybody. If Lefty made $50, he's going to give me 25 of them. That's right. They know that. Who else had to be there? Everyone. But look, I can't tell you. Yeah, I know, I know. There was no quick resolutions to the sit downs. I just had to stay cool and wait for days, weeks. Lefty came down the holiday, and Rossi and I were driving him to Miami, where he needed to talk to some people. I want to get rid of all the old men, he says. They can't do us no good. They're 80 years old. They don't want to be bothered. You can't retire them. It's no good, because they lose their prestige. We're stuck with them. Lefty had been made an acting captain by Sonny, and he was sizing things up in the family. He ran it for a while about Mira. I say, well, he's not going to go against you one-on-one. -on -one. You know that. Ain't a fucking man in New York City would go up against me one-on-one -on -one because I would do a cowboy style right on South Street, one block walking at each other. How many pistols you want? Two? Let's walk up against each other. One of us has got to fucking die or both of us die. That's what I would do. I wouldn't give a fuck and don't forget it. I'll stay with Sonny and show honor. Well, Rusty knows that. Hey, let me tell you something. We were fighting a war, the Bananos. Rusty was my chauffeur. Because you know what kind of a fucking man I was, and he was the fucking underboss? And he had to listen to me while he was driving the car. Rusty, cut over there. Leave my fucking window open. He was a good wheel man. Rusty knows what we got down here, right? Oh, yeah, he knows everything. That's the trouble. They all know it. Donnie, listen to me carefully, Lefty says. It was Saturday night, April 11th, and I had placed my regular call. The car, your friend's car? Meet me in Fort Lauderdale tomorrow. Why? What's the matter? Why don't you just listen? Because I can cancel you out right now. I want you to come in alone. I don't know what name I'm going under. I'm going to come in with some people. Can you get that car? That was Rossi's four-door Lincoln. I guess so. Why? Donnie, don't say I guess so why. Just say yes, and you meet me in Fort Lauderdale. Of course I can get it. I could use spaghetti, but my friend and I want you. I'm trying to get in touch with Nick because we cannot go in cold. I got to go into that hotel for one day, and then we'll take it from there, okay? All right. Nick was the manager at the Duval Hotel, Lefty's friend. That's all, pal. I'll explain everything. My friend requested you. You're coming in with us. I got work to do. If you don't like the idea, if you back out, fine. No problem. You go back home. But I want to put you in on this. Serious. 
because we spoke about something, you and I, right? I know what you're talking about. I got plane tickets, 10 o'clock, Delta Flight 1051, first class from Kennedy. We'll be there 1230 tomorrow afternoon. You start coming in six hours before time. Drive in from Tampa with your big car. Yeah, I tell you, if you want to back away from it, no problem. You go back and there's nothing said. I told you, two guys requested you, him and I. I'm taking full responsibility. He asked me if I wanted you, okay? All right. Years earlier, Lefty had promised that when the time was right, he'd take me along. Now I was being taken on a hit. From various conversations over the last couple of weeks, I had pieced together just how the feuding Bonanno family factions lined up, just how ominous the friction was between them. Aligned with Rusty Rustelli were Sally Ferruglia, Consigliere Steve Canone, Captain Sonny Black, and Joe Messina. Against Rusty were Captain Caesar Bonaventure, Philip Phil Lucky Giacone, Dominic Big Trin Trinchera, and Alphonse Sonny Red and Delicato, and his son, Anthony Bruno and Delicato. Lefty had been hinting at how everything was coming to a head and had let me know that Sonny was the key to all the power, especially now that he had an alliance with Santo Traficante. The opposing captains feared Sonny's expanding power. I faced a major problem. As an agent, I couldn't actually participate in a hit. In fact, it was our duty to prevent the hit if possible. Yet, as a bad guy, I couldn't turn down the invitation without losing credibility. I called case agent Jim Kinney in Tampa. He agreed that the only thing we could do was put a surveillance team on me from the time I got to Miami. The surveillance team can tail us until the last possible minute, until I signal or something, and they can stop us on a traffic violation or some bullshit charge. They could say they recognize us as mob guys, ask us what we're doing down there together. That happens to these guys all the time. That way, they probably wouldn't suspect a tip-off, yet it might be enough of a disruption to cause them to call off the hit. Kinney would hurry to set up the surveillance. I would head to Fort Lauderdale. It was a very dicey situation. I drove Rossi's car to the Fort Lauderdale airport, arriving five minutes before the scheduled arrival of Lefty's flight. Lefty's flight came. People filed off. No Lefty. No nobody. I called Sonny in Brooklyn. What's going on, Sonny? We called it off. Call the other guy. He'll explain it to you. The hit was going to be on Phil Lucky, Lefty told me. They called it off because he was in Miami by himself, and they decided they wanted to get three captains together, that it wasn't smart to hit them one at a time. I'm sorry, Lefty says. Next time, Left, don't ask me or say you don't have to do it. If we got something to do, I'd do it. They'll never feel that I'm going to back out of something. You had a choice, though. What choice? We do things together. I'm not worried about no choice. On April 13th, two days after the aborted hit, Lefty called. Donnie, listen to me carefully and listen good. I'm leaving with some people. I can't make no phone calls. If everything comes out all right, you're in pretty good shape in New York. Understand? Yeah. Now this is the last time you're going to hear from me. I'm being picked up in a little while. And don't call the other guy. Okay, don't call nobody. And do me a favor. Try to stay as close as possible, just in case when something does come off, that we know where to contact you. You understand? Yeah, because I'm going to work from the street. I didn't hear from Lefty until five days later when I finally learned that I had survived the sit-downs. I just got back from Brooklyn, he says. Everything went good. We'll be all right. We're on top. Hey, that's good. But these motherfuckers, they was all partying. They thought I was clipped, you know, when I was missing. They had me fucking dead, those motherfuckers. So everybody's celebrating. Are they crazy or what? Even Mike Sabella. He doesn't know that I know. But he was saying, that's a shame but I'm glad I took his wife's jewelry. Lefty had put up his wife's jewelry as collateral on a loan. I say, what a surprise he's going to have, huh? Unbelievable, those motherfuckers. What till I talk to Blackstein Amar? He knew they thought I was clipped, but he didn't know it got that far. 
Blackstein was sunny black. Those cocksuckers, Lefty says. They don't know the surprise they're going to get in a couple of months. I got news for you, pal. Nobody bothers you no more. When that man comes out, you're going to be in good shape. Oh, yeah? I stuck with you all the way. And it's very surprising he stood by you, too. Blackstein? Yeah. Good. Because of what I did this here week, you're a lot better off tonight. He wanted me to meet him in Miami, where he would fill me in more on the results of the sit-downs. Rossi and I picked up Lefty at the airport in Miami. Mirror and his side had lost the sit-downs. I was okay. The case is closed, Lefty says. There's no more. They lost, and they lost nationwide. New York, Miami, Chicago. They lost nationwide. Listen, that's why it took me fucking five days to go out and do what I had to do. That's good. Sonny happy now? Forget about it. Lit up like Luna Park. Well, I'm glad yous are satisfied, because this is the whole thing in a nutshell. Hey, Left, that's what we were working for all this time, right? We're hurting, in the sense that we don't have big money, but we have the power today. I'd rather have the power than the money, because these guys have all got the money, and they don't know what to do with it no more. Where are they going to go? They can't run to nobody. They still got their captains, but who are the captains going to go to? Are they still going to be under Rusty, those guys? Everybody's under Rusty, the law of the land, nationwide. There's only one fucking boss, and that's it. And nobody can take his place. We went into the piano bar at the Duval. Lefty told us that he, Sonny, Joey Messino, and Nicky Santora had been engaged in an important job in New York for the commission. He said that they had put it together, and that in return they had been assured by the commission that Rustelli would remain boss. I didn't know what Lefty had done during his five days working from the street or what they had done for the commission or whether it was all one and the same. I assumed it involved a hit because everything was typical of that, the secrecy and the working from the street, the fact that afterward all the serious problems raised in the sit-downs and going all the way up to the boss were solved. We were sitting there listening to Lefty spin out his tale of trouble between family factions, shit with Mira, all the difficult and violent solutions within the mob. Lefty, Rossi says, I understand how we all like to make money, but what is the actual advantage to being a wise guy? Are you kidding? What the... Donnie, don't you tell this guy nothing. Tony, as a wise guy, you can lie, you can cheat, you can steal, you can kill people legitimately. You can do any goddamn thing you want, and nobody can say anything about it. Who wouldn't want to be a wise guy? The next afternoon, we were sitting by the pool at the Duval. Lefty was moaning and groaning about us not hustling enough. He wanted a lounge on the beach for status. Let's do it now, he says, because I'm older and tired. He complained about everything. Promised about the racetrack. We embarrassed ourselves. It died. Promised about the Vegas night. It died. Promised about bingo, it died. Rossi went inside. Lefty complained that Rossi wasn't pulling his weight and that I wasn't leaning on Rossi enough. He droned on for another hour. At four o'clock, he says, I think I'll go up and take a nap, so I'll be fresh for when we go out tonight. A few minutes later, Rossi came out. You won't believe what I did. I turned the air conditioning up full blast and took the switch off. Holy shit, I say. We're going to hear him screaming all the way out here at the pool. I ain't going up there for a while because he's going to be going bullshit. Lefty hated air conditioning. Summers in New York or Tampa, in cars and hotel rooms, he would not allow me to turn it on. We always stayed together in hotel rooms. He always had a cold. Sometimes, even in the summer, he would turn the heat on in the room. It's too damp in here, he'd say. Lefty, you're fucking nuts. This is crazy. I'm getting another room. He chain-smoked his English ovals. If I was lucky, he had a room where you could open the windows. This time we were staying in one of the penthouse suites. The three of us together. Finally, Rossi and I went up to the room. Donnie, you cocksucker, you did this. Lefty is stomping around the nice, cool room. You fucking snuck up here and did this just to break my fucking balls. 
Call the maintenance. Get this fucking air conditioning fixed. Why don't you just turn it down? It ain't got no fucking switch. Rossi is laughing so hard he can barely stand up because Lefty is hollering at me and not him. I couldn't even take a nap, Lefty rants on. I've been up here two fucking hours freezing my ass off. Why didn't you call maintenance? Because you did this thing. Okay, I did it. You ain't going to dinner with me tonight. Okay, I'll eat by myself. Meanwhile, Rossi is on his hands and knees. Here it is, he says, pulling the switch out from under the couch. He puts the switch back on and turns the air conditioning off. The room is filled with too much cigarette smoke and too much lefty, and it's making me crazy. I walk out. Rossi comes after me. I stop in the hall. Tony, I'm going back in there and stab that motherfucker. With everything else there was to worry about, I had to take this daily shit. Rossi thought I was serious. That's how fed up I was with Lefty. I talked to Lefty in the morning on May 5th. It was a routine phone call. Nothing in his voice suggested anything unusual. Normal chit-chat, goodbye. I placed my usual call in the evening. Louise said Lefty wasn't there. She didn't know where he was. I called the next morning. Louise said Lefty hadn't come home. She still knew nothing. I called case agent Jerry Lahr in New York. I told him that Lefty was missing. He said they had received word from two informants that three Bonanno captains had gotten whacked the night before. Philly Lucky, Sonny Red, and Big Trin. The three had apparently been summoned to Brooklyn to a peace meeting to patch up differences at a catering establishment. Our information was that's where they were murdered. No bodies had been found. The heart of the opposition to Rusty Rustelli and Sonny Black had been whacked out all at once. The other main rival, Caesar Bonaventure, was in jail in Nassau County, New York, on a weapons charge. But the word was that he had decided to come over to Sonny's side anyway and bring the zips. Three days later, Lefty called me in the afternoon. I just got in. Did you talk to Louise yet? I called her this morning for two minutes, that's all. You know why I'd come in? Because she sent me all my clothes last night. Whole box. She leaves the fucking pants out. She starts crying at first. What are you crying for, I say? I got the clothes. I sent her a grand, you know, because I didn't know how long you'd be gone. It's going to be a while yet, but let me throw a curve at you. I'm listening. Go ahead. Everything is fine. We're winners. A couple of punks ran away, but they're coming back. They came back. We gave them sanctuary. Is that right? What we got to do with you is we got to work out one more situation. I'm with that guy day and night. Have a little patience. Yeah, well, I figured something was going on. Now, don't talk to me, Donnie, but visualize what took place. Yeah, all right. I visualized the hits. You understand? I understand what you're talking about. Six days after the hits, the wife of Philip, Philly Lucky G. and Cohn, filed a missing persons report on her husband with the Suffolk County, New York Police Department. You know what, uh, Philly Lucky, only, uh, two weeks before he got hit? Seven million cash. Seven million. His wife is barbecuing out there. She goes, I want to buy a cell phone someday, Seven million? What does she give a uh, shit if he got hit? He left 75 million, but... He, what the hell kind of business he sell? Well, he had a truck in her. Yeah, before it's trucked around. Oh, the truck. Oh. Seven million cash. This motherfucker, a young guy, 50 years old. That's all fully lucky. Well, that's all. Want to be boss? Well, he could ever be boss. On Tuesday, May 12th, Lefty called and said that Sonny wanted to see me right away. I told him that I needed a couple of days to clear up some business. Then I would be up. It's very important, he says, so let me know as soon as you make arrangements. I didn't have any business to clear up in Florida, but even in this instance, I didn't want to seem too anxious. I was being summoned by Sonny for one of two reasons. Either I was going to be whacked or I was going to be told about the hits and maybe be involved in the other situation that was still left to take care of. Either mission was crucial enough for me to make one arrangement, which didn't take long. I flew into LaGuardia on the afternoon of May 14th, got off the plane, and immediately saw the agent I was to look for, Billy Flynn. I followed him silently into the men's room. He slipped me a wallet containing a transmitter. I dropped it into my sports coat pocket and went out. 
I rented a car and drove to Graham Avenue and Wither Street in Brooklyn and parked up the street from the Motion Lounge, arriving about 3.30. I didn't park right in front because I wanted to walk and case the block. In recent weeks, I had been in regular telephone contact with Jules Bonavolante at headquarters. Lately, Jules had been testing my condition. Are you getting tired? You getting home enough? You think it should come out soon? Now with the hits, headquarters was very nervous. When they found out that I was going to a meeting with Sonny, a couple of people thought that maybe he was setting me up, that they were going to kill me. I said, what would they kill me for? I'm with Sonny. He's the one that asked me to come up. Jules agreed with me that Sonny wasn't setting me up. Still, there was a lot of nervousness. Sonny was now a target for retaliation. I was close to him. That made me a target, too. They wanted not only a surveillance team on me, which was reasonable, but they wanted SWAT guys hidden on their roofs. Are you crazy, I said, in that neighborhood, Sonny's neighborhood? You're going to put guys on rooftops with rifles? Just put a good crew on the street. I'll be all right. As I was walking up the block toward the motion lounge, I knew the surveillance team was there somewhere. I was looking for them to make sure they were in place. I am trained and experienced to spot such things on the street. I looked carefully. I knew they were there. I never made them. I never saw them at all. That's how good they were. Sonny was waiting at the bar. The scene looked placid. Booby was playing the electronic pinball machine. Charlie was behind the bar. And Jimmy Legs was there. I walked in, gave Sonny, Booby, and Jimmy a kiss and a hug. Normal greetings. How you doing? How's Florida? Everything was normal. Sonny asked me to come into the back room. We sat at a car table. You know, we took care of those three guys, were his first words. They're finished. You got any reliable people in Miami? Yeah, why? Because one guy got away. Bruno. You know Anthony Bruno? Anthony Bruno and Delicato was Sonny Red's son. I may have seen him. I don't know. I think he went to Miami because he's got a $3,000 a day coke habit and he's got connections with the Colombians down there. I want you to find him. When you find him, hit him. Be careful because when he's coked up, he's crazy. He's not a tough guy with his hands, but if he has a gun, you know? Yeah, okay. He might be down there with his uncle, J.B. If you come across them both, just kill them both and leave them on the street. You want me to send Lefty down there with you? Are you kidding? I'd rather be by myself. That makes it so much quicker. All right, any way you want to do it. I'm going to come down maybe next week or so. Then I was going to talk to the old man. Have you got a place to lay up over there now? We can go to a lot of places down there. There's a Duval, Broads, stockpile of Broads. All right, now we're leaving it to you to get down there. He said that the day before the hits, Tony Mirror had said he was going with the opposition. On the day of the hits, Sonny called Mirror's uncle, Al Walker, and told him to come to the motion lounge. They sat him down put a guy on either side of him and made him sweat until word came that the hits had gone down. When he heard that, Sonny says, he turned ash white. He thought we were going to hit him too, but I just reamed him out about Tony, told him Tony was no good and that he'd better recognize that and act right himself. He agreed, Donnie. Sonny says, this is the first time in over 10 years that the family has control over itself instead of being controlled by the commission. Donnie, Watch out for the kid. I got to get him before he gets me, because I can't rest a night and we can't go places until we get this kid. That's our only obstacle. The guy, we can't get a proper introduction, but the question, the guy knows who I am. He ain't gonna cut no corners with me. I know who he is. He ain't gonna cut no, I ain't gonna cut no corners. How will he know who you are? Because my cousin is fucking see. Well, it's that, that's that safe. But we still would not go into the fucking shaking hands. It's two wise guys. That's where he's gonna accept it. Well, wait a minute, that's what I want. I want you to, you to go there as a white guy, and then all you do is you tell him this kid is going to do the talking for us. I, I know how to talk. I know you're not a talk. I'm just telling you what I want. I understand. The guy knows I'm a wise guy. We never got a prophecy. It's a dust. I'm going to say, look, this, this guy represents me, and he's going to do all the talking. And that's all. The guy's going to acknowledge it. That's all, all we need. That's because all. there was two moves made on me already over here. You understand? And I don't want, and the two moves that were made on me, I can live with. I don't want to touch you. I don't want to pull up. Well, let's, you know what I mean? let's put it this way. The moves were made on you. Why couldn't you reject somebody's name? 
because we weren't at that stage yet. Now we're at that stage where we can do that. I only met this guy yesterday. The moves weren't made by him. You know, I mean, the moves were made by him, but not by him. Well, that politician, if I just think there was a move made on my man, I want to put it that way. Don't, don't put it that way. Lefty was at home, sick with a cold. We sat on the couch, and I started to tell him about my conversation with Sonny. I already know what Sonny asked you to do, he says. He's in control of the family now, Donnie. I'm really happy that he's having you clip Bruno, because it'll look good in the eyes of the bosses that you did some work. It's a good contract. Yeah, I'm glad too, Left. The kid was supposed to be there. He didn't show because he was all coked up, too high. I said that before I went back to Brooklyn, I was going over to see my girl for a short while. All right, he says. I would go with you to Brooklyn, but I'm dying here. I did go to Jersey. I went across the George Washington Bridge to the Holiday Inn off Route 80, where I met with agents Jimmy Costler, Jerry Lahr, and Jim Kinney. I told them the whole story of the afternoon. Even though theoretically the conversation had been received from the transmitter and recorded, we couldn't count on that, so I wanted to relay the information as soon as possible. I gave them the transmitter because the batteries were shot anyway. I felt good. I wasn't a made guy, but I was given a contract to hit a made guy. All the wise guys could see how close I was to Sonny, who was becoming the main power in the family, aside from Rusty Roselli, who was in the can. The next day I flew to Tampa, then drove to Miami. Three days later I called Sonny to report, then I called Lefty. I told everybody that I was hitting a lot of joints looking for the kid. I did show my face around. I wasn't worried about running into him or having somebody run to me with a tip that he was around the corner, which would have put me in a bad situation. After all, the mob was looking for him. So was the FBI, which hoped to snatch him off the street for his own protection, at which time I could tell Sonny that I had done the job. If the mob and the FBI couldn't find him, I didn't have much to worry about. The only thing some of the people at the Bureau were concerned about was that as word got around that I had the contract on Anthony Bruno, he might start looking to whack me out. I stayed in the Miami area for about a week. Then Sonny called me. I don't think he's down there. I think we got him up here in New York. So you go back to Tampa. A couple of days later, during my routine daily call, Lefty says, Just buy today's post, that's all. I don't get it down here until tomorrow. Tomorrow you get it. Give me a call in the morning. The article in the New York Post had the headline, Mob Snuffs Out Ambitious Boss. The article said that the body of Alphonse, Sonny Red, and Delicato had been found in a shallow grave in a vacant lot in Ozone Park, Queens, and described the body as bullet-riddled. A couple of kids had been playing, and they saw a cowboy boot sticking out of the ground. Two close associates of his were missing and presumed dead. I called the next morning. I saw that article. Yeah, huh? There's a lot of warm heat over here. Forget about it. Over that? Yeah, over a lot of things. We're all right, though, huh? Now that there was open warfare, with key family members being murdered, headquarters wanted to pull me out and close the operation. They wanted to close it right away by June 1st. More murders were expected. Jules Bonavolante felt that since I was close to Sonny and had been given a contract, I myself was a target to get whacked. I could understand their concern, but I didn't agree with it. I was so close to getting made and becoming a real wise guy that I could taste it. Soon Rusty Rustelli would be out of prison. I was sure that Sonny planned to move fast on it. He gave me the contract so that I would have that credential when he put my name up. He needed as a close ally a soldier he could trust and who could face other wise guys as an equal. Sonny had already said that I would be doing a lot of traveling for him. As a made guy, I would have enormous clout as his emissary. I would be able to sit down with anybody. As a wise guy, I would be Sonny's partner. Sonny could have used me almost like an ambassador, an intermediary with other families. The help I could give to other investigations as a made guy was limitless. When it ultimately became known that I had penetrated the mob and become a made guy, it would humiliate the mafia and end forever the myth of the mafia's invincibility. I wanted to stay under until at least August. There were arguments against becoming a made guy. Some felt that if I became made, I would have less flexibility and independence. I would no longer be excused for dumb mistakes, which were really things I had done, 
moves I had made or not made for the benefit of the investigation. I would have to do what they told me to do. I could be ordered to commit crimes. Jules was one of those against my staying in and getting made. Primarily, the question boiled down to safety. Nobody thought I was safe enough any longer. They felt that we had already made a bundle of important cases and it wasn't worth the risk of staying under just to make a couple more. I felt safe enough. As much as it hurt to face ending the operation after five years, I had to accept the decision. We had a meeting outside Washington, D.C. at the Crystal City Marriott. Rossi, Shannon, Jules, me, various supervisors and headquarters people and case agents. There were several other operations involved in one way or another with ours and that made it rather complex to end our operation cleanly. We set a date, July 26th. Now the job was no longer to penetrate deeper into the family. I was simply to work for as much information as possible in the six weeks before I had to come out. Actually, that wasn't so simple. For the mob, it was business as usual, and it had to seem like that with me too, which included navigating through the family warfare. Booby's daughter was going to get married, and we were all invited to the wedding on June 20th. I went up to New York on June 15th to be with Sonny and the crew. They were still looking for the kid, Anthony Bruno. On my way into the motion lounge, I ran into Nicky Santora. I said, the kid's not in Miami, Nicky. We scoured the fucking place. We got a couple fillers out now. We'll know this week. I went over to Manhattan to the Holiday Bar to see Lefty. We went for a walk on Madison Street. He was aggravated with everybody, and a walk on the street was the only place he could really let his hair down. He wasn't getting a proper split of profits. He was being ignored or unappreciated or mistreated. They all got the connections and I'm a jerk off. Who's going to pay me? Sonny's trying to hold me back. Push me for like 200 a week here, 200 a week there to pacify me. Meanwhile, he's making like 30000 a week. Sooner or later, he wants to get rid of me by making me a captain. But I got to do it in Miami. He gives me a couple thousand then I'm going to go to Miami. Meanwhile, they're knocking it down. Booby's got 1500 a week in salary, and they got all the junk. They took it all. How come you're not in on that? Why? Because he's a greedy cocksucker, he says, meaning Sonny. You did all the work for him, he grunts. Donnie, they gave me the contract now on the kid. Once I do that, the guy can go fuck himself. They found that one body, huh? Yeah, that was a mistake. Joey Messina, he's the one that fucked it up. Sonny's really hot about it. Sonny Red's body, like the others, was supposed to have been chopped up and gotten rid of properly, not buried quickly and whole. You have no idea, Lefty says. The guy choked. He put a hand to his throat in the gesture used about athletes who don't come through in the clutch. He said that the guys in on the hits were himself, Jimmy Legs, Nicky Santora, and a guy named Bobby Capazio. When they came out of the building, Jerry Chili told them that the kid was around the corner. I said, Bobby, let's go over there. He says, no, 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 Lefty. Sonny Black told you to go to Brooklyn. The kid was around the corner, Donnie. We could have boxed the corner. Having done that work, Lefty was all the more disturbed with not getting a fair share of everything in the family. In fact, before the war started, Lefty says, he says, Lefty, you come in on salary. We're going to be millionaires in three months. I got shut out again. Who am I to speak up? And you wonder why I get aggravated? Now I get the contract for the kid. Uh-huh. Who the fuck you kidding? Only four guys can go. Me, Jimmy Legs, Nicky, and Bobby. What are you trying to do? I went through already. It's a suicide thing. To the house? They had information that the kid was holed up in a house on a cul-de-sac in Riverhead, far out on Long Island. It's a bad corner. You come on the fucking block, the kid spots us. We're dead. Sonny wants us to hit pay dirt. Pay dirt? Sonny, who the fuck are you kidding? He sits there playing with fucking birds. But when he's in trouble, he opens his gut. 
I don't stay with him no more. I used to spend all day and night with him. I'll tell you one thing, it fucking hurts inside. You really eat your guts. I went back to the motion lounge, and that night I stayed with Sonny at his apartment. I had a transmitter in the pocket of my slacks. When we went to bed, I hung up my slacks and other clothes. Either of us would have felt comfortable going into the other's pockets if we needed a couple of bucks to go to the bakery or something. There was always that chance, but you don't sleep with your pants on. So I just hung them up and went to sleep on the pull-out couch. At 6.45, Sonny woke me up with coffee and rolls. We sat in the dining room in our shorts. It was his birthday. I gave him $200 as a present. He gave me a pistol. He wanted everybody packing now because retaliation from the other side was a good possibility. The pistol was a blue-black German-made 25 automatic with the serial number scraped off the side of the barrel. It had a full clip of bullets. Carry this at all times, especially the wedding. We talked about King's Court. He was anxious to get back together with Santa Traficani. When you coming to Florida, I ask. Maybe next week. There's going to be a big meeting of bosses next week, and I can't leave until after that. He started writing in a small blue notebook where he kept a tab on his loan sharking business. I'm finally starting to make some money. I got thirty grand a week coming in. I got over seventy thousand on the street. If only I didn't have to dish out and support so many people. We went upstairs to feed the pigeons. Sonny was in a quiet mood. You have any line on where Bruno is? I asked. We have a line in him. We're going to give JB a pass, though. They weren't going to kill the kid's uncle. How come? You've got to give up something to lure the cat to you. We were quiet for a while as he moved around the coops. Lefty and Booby met at the Holiday Bar on Madison Street. Some former cop in the New York Police Department was offering a copy of an up-to-date police report detailing the investigation of the Bonanno family, including surveillance reports and names of people who were going to be subpoenaed to appear before a grand jury. The guy wanted $5,000 for the report. Lefty was urging its purchase. The fucking thing is like a book. It goes back to May 4th, the day before it happened on a Monday night. Right? There was a meeting. They were observed. Just go to the family and let it come out of the kitty. I drove Lefty to Brooklyn. Sonny and Joey are feuding, he says, because Sonny's got more power. So Joey got an unlisted telephone number now. He ain't talking to nobody because of this feud with Sonny. Lefty and Booby talked to Sonny about the offered police report. Lefty came out of the motion lounge disappointed. He doesn't want it. He didn't want to pay the 5000 Lefty wanted to look at a new Cadillac he might buy. Nicky drove us to Queens to the dealers to look at it. It was burgundy. Rock bottom price was $15,300. Lefty decided to buy it. They talked about looking for the kid, casing the house. Should I take the shotgun, Nicky asked. Lefty laughs. Yeah, just like last time. You shot the guy that ain't supposed to be shot. They all laughed. One of their own guys, Santo Giordano, had been shot accidentally in the hip and left paralyzed. That was their best joke of the day. In the beginning of my undercover role as Donnie Brasco, I had occasional fears about the dangers of being an agent. Now I also had fears about the dangers of being a bad guy. As things had now developed into family warfare, I could get whacked for being either an agent or a bad guy. Some mornings when I stayed at Sonny's, I would get up and go into the bathroom and look in the mirror, and I would find myself thinking, is today the day that I'm going to get whacked? Left and I were having a lunchtime cappuccino at Cafe Capri. Tap Jerry Chili's phones, he says. He knows where the kid is. Tap Jerry Chili's phones and we'll get the kid. I'll put a bug in Jerry's house. We'll visit him. He'll invite us in, you know. Booby goes there with a bullshit story, puts a bug in there, and a bug outside, on a tree or something. Jerry was very close to the kid's father. Sonny Red's wife gave Jerry Chili Sonny Red's car to sell for her. So we put a bug in Chili's house on Staten Island. I hope so, I say. Now, you're going to get strained out, Donnie. But please, let me tell you. First of all, you and I are going to do a little talking while we're away. Where you come from and all that. Because this is going to come back on me. Sonny came in and joined us. He said that Sally Ferrugia wanted to make some of the Zips captains. But that would be crazy, Sonny says. Because those guys are looking to take over everything. That's why these three guys were killed. 
They went against the Zips, and the Zips came over to our side. We were the ones slated to get hit, but because Sonny Red screwed the Zips, they swung over to us. There's no way we can make them captains. We lose all our strength. He said he urged Sally to take a firmer hand as acting boss until Rusty got out of jail. You're going to be in Shit's Creek, Sonny, Lefty says. Good. I've been in Shit's Creek 18 years. I advise you to be a little strong, because them fucking zips ain't going to back up to nobody. You give them the fucking power? If you don't get hurt now, you get hurt three years from now. They'll bury you. You cannot give them the power. They don't give a fuck. They don't care who's boss. They got no respect. There's no family. Sally don't want no problems with us, Sonny says. Sure, I don't blame him. Look at the position he got himself in. I mean, what if the guy stays in another ten years? You think they're going to let him out? Especially with this RICO law? So what we going to do? Stand on a corner? I'm starting from day one. Yeah, but don't weaken, Lefty says. You weaken, you got a headache. You won't get a headache now. You'll get it three years from now. They'll bury you. I'm telling you, they'll bury you. Well, Sonny, you do what you got to do. Your word counts with me. I just can't go along with it, because there are some things I can't do for certain people and some things I did already. You do what you got to do. You got to put fear in these guys. I don't put fear in there, Sonny says. I put friendship. You know, I almost didn't win the battle. A bunch of us were sitting around the motion lounge with guns in our belts, swapping stories. Sonny, Nicky, Lefty, Jimmy Legs, and others. Sonny had ordered us to be armed at all times. Jimmy Legs was packing a forty-five caliber. Nobody used holsters. You carried your pistol in your sports coat pocket or your belt. Jimmy Legs had a big belly, but the rest of him was skinny. He had no hips or butt. So when he'd walk around, the forty-five kept falling down through his pants legs. He had this bright idea that he would sew a pocket on the inside of his pants at the small of his back and carry the gun in that pocket. So this evening he had just installed the pocket and was using it for the first time. We were bullshitting about the world situation and how the United States should be tougher on other countries and not be pushed around. About how the liberals running our spy business should learn something from the methods of the KGB, which could do anything it wanted to in order to be effective. Somebody brought up the different ways you could kill people in the spy business. I told them a story about one of the methods. A KGB agent had an umbrella with a sharpened tip, and they put poison on it, and he'd walk by somebody and just prick him the leg or arm with this umbrella. They thought this was the greatest thing in the world. The CIA should be able to do that stuff and not be so answerable to Congress anymore, like it had been since Watergate. We got to laughing at some of the stories, and Jimmy Legs suddenly took off for the John. A few moments later, we heard a commotion. Jimmy Legs came out of the john, dangling his forty-five from his thumb and forefinger. I had the shit so bad that I forgot about my gun pocket, and when I took down my pants and began, the gun fell in the bowl so I had to fish it out. Hey, if we had to go to war and I had to kill somebody, I'd just leave a little shit on it that'd get on the bullet, and all I'd have to do was nick somebody, and I'd kill them with the poison just like the fucking KGB. The wedding reception for Booby's daughter was scheduled for 7 p.m. at Shalimar Caterers, 2380 Highland Boulevard on Staten Island. We started gathering at the Motion Lounge at about 5 p.m. Lefty, Nicky Santora, Boots Tomasulo, Bobby Capazio, Sonny, Charlie the Bartender, and others. The rules were that we would all stay around Sonny at all times, not leave his side, because this would be a good time for retaliation against him. Other families were going to be represented at the wedding, too, so we didn't know who might do what. Some guys brought their wives or girlfriends. We were going to travel in a caravan, so we discussed how to get there and who was going with who. We had to make sure everybody was packing. Nicky had a forty-five that was too big for his waistband, so we gave that to Boots, and Nicky carried a little thirty-two caliber. I, of course, had my twenty-five automatic. I drove with Boots and Nicky. Everybody was at the reception. Lefty and Louise, Jimmy Legs, Jerry Chili, Mr. Fish Rubito, Dennis the Cop, Nicky Marangello, Mike Sabella. One notable absence was Joy Messina, which really ticked off Sonny and Lefty. That jerk off is afraid to get caught out in the open, Lefty says. That's all. I sat at Sonny's table with Nicky, Charlie, and Boots. 
Everybody had a girlfriend except Boots and me. It was a big, fancy reception with an open bar, a band, a prime rib sit-down dinner. All kinds of wise guys were there from different families, including Jerry Lang, the acting boss of the Colombo family. Booby was proud, but quiet and controlled as always. We sat around Sonny and kept our eyes open. There were photographers cruising around the room, but Sonny's rule was no photographs at any tables where his crew sat. At about 11 p.m., we all went back to the motion lounge to relax for a while. Sonny gave me $4,000 to put on the street in Florida as Shylock money. I flew back to Tampa the following day. I couldn't carry the gun Sonny had given me on the plane, so I took the handle apart, scratched my initials and the date on the metal underneath, put it back together, and handed it to another agent at the airport for him to take to Florida. On July 12th, Nicky Santora called. You know that kid? You know the kid that up from up here? Yeah. So you got what he's down there. Oh, yeah? You know, so we just wondering maybe you could get him with something. Uh, where, where, where at? Uh, I don't know. I guess I think my... Oh, wait, so? That's what I think. We're not positive, but... You know? Yeah. It's more logical that it would be down there. Yeah. Well, what, you know, as of when? Uh, the end of last week, like, last and... Friday or Saturday. Uh, any idea what part, or? No. No idea. Huh? You know, if, if you go, if it, you know, maybe you can get a line on somebody. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll make uh, a couple phone calls to, you know, yeah. some, some good people down here. Yeah. And, uh, but just, you know, be careful, watch yourself. Yeah. Trying to see what's going on, because I'm having a little noise down there, too, huh? Yeah. Yeah. On July 23rd, Lefty called. That guy's coming out tomorrow. He's got something in the back of his head. I don't know what the fuck's happening. Lefty had been feuding with Sonny for the way the crew was being handled. Listen, Donnie, I want to be under the, uh, the guy that's coming home. I'm allowed that request. Is that right? Now, if I got it, I don't answer to nobody but him. That means I can go with you over to him? Huh, Left? That's it. You stay with me and we don't answer to nobody. Follow me? Well, what do you want me to do with this guy when he comes down here? Go along with him. Just play it cool. All right. He's making all kinds of efforts. And so you know what the Zip said? We don't like this guy. We don't trust him. Is that right? They don't want him. He went over their heads. There's a feud going on. I don't care, Donnie. My guys are happy. I don't bother them, you know. We don't bother our people. That's right. But this guy, I don't know what he's doing to himself. I'll tell you, Donnie. Sonny Black is in a fucking fog. So Lefty was going to put me with him directly under the boss, Rusty Rustelli, when he got out of prison in a few weeks. I could never relate as closely to Lefty as to Sonny, but one thing about Lefty I could rely on. Everything he ever told me about the Mafia turned out to be true. I prepare for my final weekend in the Mafia, my last days as Donnie Brasco, as the host of Sonny. Sonny was anxious to move ahead and make all the money we could make through our hookup with Traficante. He felt that a large part of his future was going to be in Florida. Sonny and Nicky Santora came down on Friday, July 24th, and had Rossi call Benny Husick to see if they couldn't set up a meeting for Saturday. Not in Tampa, because Sonny felt there was too much heat on the both of them there, but in Holiday. Rossi reached Husick at the Bayshore Country Club in Miami. Husick said they would try to be in Holiday by 5 p.m. This weekend we had planned to pump Sonny and Nicky for everything we could get. Now we were really coming to the end and we can go for it. Like a pitcher airing it out in the last couple of innings. We knew it would be the last time we would see them. We would push conversations into any mob area we could bring up and grab anything that we could. It didn't matter if we went too far because everything was history after this weekend. We wanted to loosen them up right away. Friday night we went to Pappas's restaurant to eat and then bounced around to a few places. We went to Clearwater Beach to a hotel where there was a comedian performing. We went back to the club and finished up at about 6 a.m. Saturday morning. They were having a good time. They didn't talk business. Traficante and Husick arrived at the Tahitian Motor Lodge on the dot at 5 p.m. Saturday and went straight to Sonny's room. A few minutes later, the three of them left the room and went to the coffee shop. They talked there for about 40 minutes. Then Traficante and Husey got up, shook hands with Sonny, and left in Traficante's Cadillac. Sonny called Rossi and me into the coffee shop. He was ecstatic. 
The meeting have been terrific. Now you guys got to get your asses moving and start producing. Bingo, gambling, numbers, dog tracks, drugs. Everything was going to go big now. Teaming up with Santo Traficante, Florida was going to be ours. They were in such a good mood that all they wanted to do was party. They wanted to celebrate and anticipate. It turned into a constant go weekend. Neither Sonny nor Nicky was interested in talking business, no matter how we tried to maneuver conversations. In addition to our own cocktail waitresses and bartender, waitresses from other local joints and regular customers came in and joined the party. In the early morning hours, Sonny took one of the girls back to the hotel. The sun was up on Sunday morning. These were the last hours for the club and the operation. I took Nicky on ahead to Denny's for breakfast. Rossi and Shannon had to stay behind for a little while to check out the cash register and help the staff clean up. When Nicky and I had left, Rossi told the help that they were getting a surprise two-week vacation with pay because we were going to close the club for renovations. I was alone with Nicky at Denny's. There wasn't much time. I decided to take a shot at learning something about the murders of the three captains. That must have been something, I said. That thing with Sonny Red, Phil Lucky, and Big Trin. I never saw anything like it in my life, Donnie. Big Trin was so huge. When the shotgun blast hit him, about 50 pounds of his stomach just went flying. What was it like with the other guys? We'll talk about it later, Donnie. Shannon and Rossi had walked in. I couldn't signal for them to leave. Nicky had not met Shannon before this weekend. He clammed up. We had breakfast and went back to the Tahitian. Nicky and Sonny packed up, and Rossi and I took them to the airport. I felt relief and discomfort at the same time. I figured that I probably wouldn't see Sonny again, not even in court. I believed he was history. I couldn't make any big deal out of the goodbye. I'll talk to you tomorrow, I said. We cleaned out our apartments. The furniture was rented, so it was just a matter of gathering up personal stuff. King's Court was locked up. The case agent would deal with it. Later in the day, Rossi flew to Washington, D.C. for his debriefing. I had to fly directly to Milwaukee to testify before the grand jury on the Balistrieri case. That case, like many others, had been held in abeyance until we wrapped up the whole operation. Eddie Shannon flew with me just for double protection. After that, I would go to Washington, D.C. for a debriefing. For a couple of weeks, I didn't have a chance to go home. After I went home for a few days, I went to New York to start working with the U.S. attorneys on the indictments. I am not inclined toward soul-searching, and during this period, I didn't have time to brood anyway. I had some uncomfortable feelings because I felt close to Sonny Black. I felt a kind of kinship with him, but I didn't feel any guilt of betrayal because I'd always maintained in my own mind and heart the separation of our worlds. In a sense, we were both just doing our jobs. If he had found out who I was, he'd have whacked me out. He would have done it in the traditional way. He wouldn't have talked to me about it. He'd have set me up. Who kills you in that business is somebody you know. Maybe he would have had Lefty do it. Maybe he would have done it himself. It would have been cold-blooded. Sonny was good at what he did. He wasn't a phony. He didn't throw his weight around. He was a stand-up guy. For reasons that are hard to explain, I liked him a lot. But I didn't dwell on the fact that I was going to put him in the can or that he was going to get killed because of me. That's the business. I knew that both Lefty and Sonny loved me in their own ways. Either would have killed me in a minute. It didn't have to be because I was an agent. They could have thought I was an informant. I could have lost a decision to Mira, and they could have been ordered to kill me. They would simply have done it. The difference between our worlds was that I wouldn't kill them. I would just put them in the can. I had a gut feeling that Sonny was going to be killed by his own people over this situation. I didn't like being responsible for anybody getting killed. But it wasn't my rules. It was their rules that would kill him. I didn't write those rules. Those rules were written by their society, not mine. So I felt bad, but I didn't dwell on it. Nothing I did in my job was affected by any feelings I had for Sonny or anybody else. That was my discipline. Some guys have trouble dealing with that aspect. When one of my friends who had been working undercover was preparing to go to court, he said he couldn't look the defendants in the eye because he felt guilty for having deceived them. You just did your job, I told him. 
You can't have those personal feelings in this business. I was not there to be buddy-buddy with these guys. I would not allow myself to become that emotionally attached. In my situation, my life was on the line every day. On the first day after Sonny and Nicky went back to New York, Lefty tried to reach me in Holiday. On the second day, three agents visited Sonny Black. They showed Sonny a photograph taken especially for this occasion. It showed me together with these three agents. They asked Sonny, Do you know this guy? He's an FBI agent. We just wanted to tell you. They didn't offer him a deal because a deal is always implicit, and a direct offer to a guy like Sonny would have been insulting to him. Sonny gave away nothing by his expression or tone of voice. I don't know him, but if I meet him, I'll know he's an FBI agent. We tracked what happened after that through wiretaps and informants. Just as anticipated, Sonny's first move after the visit was to call together the main men of his crew. Lefty, Booby, and Nicky came to the motion lounge to meet with Sonny. Sonny told them there was no way I was an agent, that if the FBI had me, they must have kidnapped me and were maybe even brainwashing me. For more than a week, they kept the story to themselves while they looked for me. They reached out to the King's Court area, even called some of our waitresses. Lefty went to Miami, and they sent two guys from New York to Chicago, Milwaukee, and California to see if they could come up with anything. After ten days, Sonny called Santo Trapicani and told him about the agent's visit and what they had said. He didn't offer interpretations or explanations. He sent word to Rusty Ristelli in prison, and then he called Paul Castellano, boss of the Gambino family, the boss of bosses. The mob held several meetings in New York over this, making a damage assessment. They distributed pictures of me, snapshots taken over the years with Lefty or Sonny or others all over the country, and all the mob families were put on alert to watch for me. The bosses considered what to do. They decided to put an open-ended, open-ended to anyone, $500,000 contract on me. There was a suggestion that they hit everybody in the mob that had anything to do with me. Obviously, certain people were going to fall, but there was nothing we could do about it. You can't get a warrant to snatch anybody off the street, even for their own protection, without definite information that the person is going to get killed. Nobody's name came to us as a definite target. Except mine. The FBI dispatched teams of agents to visit all the top mafia bosses they could find and tell them face to face, Hands off this agent. He beat you. It's finished. If they hurt me, all the resources of the Justice Department will be focused on going after them. I and the FBI were not going to be intimidated. On August 14th, 17 days after the agents had told Sonny about me, the bosses called a meeting in New Jersey. Sonny went to the meeting. I was not surprised. His options were either to turn informant or to run, or to go to the meeting. He went to the meeting and disappeared. Once we found out that Sonny was missing, I told Jerry Lar, When you see them start taking his pigeon coops down, you can close your case on Sonny Black, because then he's history. About a week later, a couple of guys were on that roof taking the pigeon coops. We figured Sonny Lefty and Tony Mirror were the most obvious targets for the mob hits because of me. Mirror because he was the first guy to bring me into Little Italy the first banana guy I hung around with, and also because they believed he was a snitch. Our information was they thought his fight for me at the sit-downs was all a ploy, that he and I were actually working together for the FBI to advance my infiltration into the mob. Lefty and Sonny were obvious targets because of my association with them. But the only definite contract we got word on was Lefty. He was the only one we could protect from his own people. On August 30th, a Sunday, Agent snatched up Lefty as he came out of his apartment building. Mira didn't get hit until March 1982. His body was found in a car in a parking lot at the corner of North Moore and West Streets, outside the building where Bonanno Consigliere Stevie Canone lived. Somebody had shot him four times in the head. He had $6,700 in his pocket. On August 2, 1982, I started testifying in the racketeering trial of Dominic Napolitano and all. On August 12, 1982, a badly decomposed body was found in a hospital bag in a creek near South Avenue in the Mariner's Harbor section of Staten Island. The body had been buried. 
Recent heavy rains had uncovered it and washed it up. The person had been shot. The hands had been chopped off. An indication of a mafia hit and a special signal that the victim had violated mob security. On November 10th, five days before Lefty, Nicky Santoro, Mr. Fish Rabito, Boots Tomasulo, and others were sentenced. The body was identified through dental records as that of Sonny Black. I was sorry it was Sonny. I was glad it wasn't me. When I emerged from undercover in 1981, there was no celebration, no homecoming, no resumption of normal life with my family. In fact, because of the death threats and the contract out on me, there was more fear of my family when I came out than when I was under. I began work immediately on preparation for the many trials, and I have testified in those trials for more than six years. Though I continued to testify when called upon, I resigned from the FBI in 1986 after 17 years of service to write a book. I am not in the Federal Witness Protection Program. I and my family have moved our home once again to another part of the country. Except in matters relating to FBI activities, I do not use the name Pistone. When I am with my family, I use the name they use. When I am traveling or engaged in anything other than testimony or family activities, I use any of several other names. At 48, I will begin a new life under a new name. Except for close friends and some government officials, no one will know that I am the man who lived this life as Joe Pistone and Donnie Brasco. Uh, let me tell you something now. Uh, point blank. Are you being by Wednesday? Yeah. Wednesday or Thursday, I told you that. You're coming in, but no, he don't know that. I didn't say anything to him. Uh, but you're coming in to meet me uptown. Yeah, Wednesday or Thursday. Yeah. All right, because uh, uh, would you like uh, to come back with us Friday night? <laughs> if I can arrange it? Yeah, you're going all the way down south? Well, I'm going with Luis. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I'm going to the floor. Yeah. So? Yeah, well, if we're going to be up there Wednesday, I might as well stay and go. I don't want the guy to know you're in town. No, so I'll stay, uh, you know. I'll stay. Yeah, I know. You stay by your girls and we'll meet by the airport. Yeah, no big deal. All right, let me see if I can arrange all these things. All right. All right, you call me tomorrow morning. All right. Bye bye. This has been an Audio Holdings production.